Good morning and uh, welcome to the March 2014, about as far as you can get into March and still call it the March 2014 uh, open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, could you please introduce our agenda for the morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. Today's agenda includes four items for your consideration. First, you will consider a first report and order that would revise rules to make 100 megahertz of 5 gigahertz uni1 band unlicensed spectrum more useful for consumers and businesses and reduce the potential for harmful interference to certain incumbent operations. Second, you will consider a report and order that would adopt allocation, licensing, service, and technical rules to make available for auction 65 megahertz of AWS3 spectrum for flexible use services, including mobile broadband. Third, you will consider an order making certain rule revisions and clarifications to facilitate the fair and effective completion of retransmission consent negotiations and a further notice of proposed rulemaking seeking comment on whether to eliminate the network non-duplication and syndicated exclusivity rules. Last on your agenda, you will consider a further notice of proposed rulemaking that initiates the 2014 quadrennial review of broadcast ownership rules, addresses issues referred to the Commission by the Third Circuit's remand of the 2008 diversity order, and a notice of proposed rulemaking to define and require the disclosure of a category of sharing agreements between broadcast television stations. The accompanying report and order determines that certain television joint sales agreements are attributable. This is your agenda for today. The first item will be presented by the Office of Engineering and Technology. Julius Knapp, Chief of the Office, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Knapp. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. OET is pleased to present for your consideration a report and, and order that will improve the usability of spectrum in the 5 gigahertz region for Wi-Fi and other products and services that operate under the Commission's rules for unlicensed devices. We don't need to look very far to appreciate the importance of Wi-Fi. I've often sat in this very room using Wi-Fi to access email, documents, presentations, and reference materials, just as I suspect many people are doing right now. <laughs> Excuse me, during this meeting, <laughs> they would want they to want, be doing something else? They want to else? get a closer picture. Oh. <laughs> uh, the Wi-Fi access is terrific, but a little less terrific when the room is packed with people all trying to access the same Wi-Fi hotspot. We're trying to improve that situation with the item we are presenting today and the work we are continuing to do to make more spectrum available for unlicensed. I'd like to commend the stakeholders for their cooperation in helping to resolve the technical issues that we address in this item. I'd also like to thank David Horowitz and Stephen Spaeth of the Office of General Counsel, Bob Nelson, Jose Albuquerque, and Chip Fleming of the International Bureau, Mark Settle, Bruce Romano, Jerry Matisse, Rashmi Doshi, and Naveed Groshahi in OET, and Bryant Wellman, who is working with OET under a fellowship from the Army. Uh, and we appreciate all of the hard work they've done on this. Here with me at the table are Karen Rackley, who is the chief of the technical rules branch, and Aoli Wilkins, who is an engineer in that branch and the author of this item. Oli will present the item. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The first report in order before you would modify the rules for unlicensed national information infrastructure devices in the 5 gigahertz band to support the introduction of the latest Wi-Fi technology offering faster data speeds, reduced congestion at Wi-Fi hotspots, and greater capability to support wireless broadband services. Specifically, this item greatly expands the utility of the 100 megahertz of unispectrum by eliminating the current rule prohibiting operation outdoors and by increasing the power level similar to that in other portions of the unispectrum. At the same time, the report and order protects the incumbent radio service in this 100 megahertz of spectrum, notably the mobile satellite service, by establishing appropriate technical requirements, including a limit on the amount of energy in the upward direction towards the satellites. We believe that these technical measures will prevent harmful interference, but as a backstop measure, we're requiring parties to notify the commission if they are deploying more than 1,000 
outdoor access points in the Uni 1 band. This will better enable the Commission to address and resolve harmful interference and the remote possibility it occurs in the future. We also provide a way for service providers to modify their existing access points already operating in other parts of the Uni band to expand into the Uni 1 band without meeting the restriction on energy in the vertical direction through a simple waiver process that would be handled at the staff level. In addition to the provisions just described, we are making the rules more consistent across the 5 gigahertz band and strengthening them to better protect incumbent services against harmful interference. We do this by including software security requirements for all Uni devices so that they cannot be modified to operate in violation of the rules and by making appropriate modifications to our measurement procedures. We are also continuing to work with the NTIA, federal agencies, and the industry to study whether additional spectrum can be made available for unlicensed use in other portions of the 5 gigahertz band as discussed in the notice of proposed rulemaking. The office recommends adoption of the first report in order and we request editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. Today's proceeding is just the latest example of smart government policy designed to promote industry innovations in unlicensed services in order to yield the greatest public benefit. The technical ingenuity which ultimately has resulted in the explosive demand for Wi-Fi services is several decades old. And on this, the last day of Women's History Month, Mr. Chairman, it is most fitting that we are adopting an order to spur greater use of services that a woman helped to create. Many are familiar with how actress Hedy Lamarr invented frequency hopping technology in the 1940s. It is more than industry lore. She actually held a patent on the idea. The federal government and commercial players eventually realized the benefits of Ms. Lamar's idea and beginning in the 1980s, in response to petitions from federal agencies and industry, the commission started promoting greater use of frequency hopping and spread spectrum in unlicensed services in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. Those policies together with the evolution of the 802.11 family of technical standards and Wi-Fi only tablets has resulted in the great consumer demand for Wi-Fi devices we see today. Once criticized by licensed wireless providers, unlicensed spectrum is now being heavily used to offload data traffic. The economists who have studied the area have different estimates, but there is a consensus that Wi-Fi offload saves wireless companies tens of billions of dollars in network costs each year. Demand for unlicensed services has spiked so much that in a 2.4 gigahertz span, it's now congested, particularly in major cities. We have to be ambitious in finding more ways to provide licensed and unlicensed spectrum for commercial services. I commend the staff for working so efficiently to bring us an order that makes 100 megahertz of spectrum in the Uni 1 band available for both, both outdoor and indoor use of unlicensed services. This was not an easy process. A couple of months ago, advocates for the Wi-Fi and satellite industries seemed locked into their litigation positions. But thanks to the careful work and, cre and creative work of Julie Knapp, Aoli Wilkins, Karen Rackley, and the rest of the team of experts, we were able to narrow their differences and arrive at technical rules that both sides approve. Today's order also has important device certification and security rules to prevent the interference that some uni devices were causing to federal operations just a few years ago. I look forward to the staff's efforts to free up an, an additional 195 megahertz in the Uni 2 and 4 bands. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Uh, thank you. I like my colleague's reference to Women's History Month. Uh, this proceeding sits at the intersection of two paradigm-shifting social and business trends. Call it a collision of cool. The first trend is well known in these parts the move to mobility. The statistics, of course, speak for themselves. In the next four years, mobile traffic is expected to increase by 11 times. By that time, there will be more mobile devices than people on the earth. But it is more than sheer volume that is at issue. It is the fact that wireless functionality will be built into everything around us and everything we do 
as we approach the coming Internet of Things. Now, the second trend is better known in technology and innovation corridors around the country, from Austin to Boston, from Seattle to Silicon Valley. It is the move toward sandboxes. Now, software developers often code sandboxes into their programs. This code allows others to access a portion of the program without harming the host platform. It provides a space to experiment within the program, minimizing risk before introducing ideas at broader scale. Up until now, sandbox culture has mostly resided within software applications. But I think it has application to a lot of what comes before us at this agency. And I've spoken before about how I think it's a useful framework for our technology transitions trials. In fact, the sweetest spot for the sandbox could come from combining its experimental possibilities with the power of unlicensed spectrum. The innovative potential is big. By making more of our airwaves subject to access by rule rather than by license, we reduce barriers to entry for innovators. We open up spaces for creative use and experimentation in the wireless network from the software layer to the equipment layer. That is why what we do here is important. Today, we increase opportunities for unlicensed in the 5 gigahertz band. In critical part, we take the flexible rules that have already made the 5.725 <coughs> to 5.825 gigahertz band an unlicensed success story, and we expand them to the 5.150 to 5.250 gigahertz band. That sounds technical. But this change is going to have real impact because we are doubling the unlicensed bandwidth in the 5 gigahertz band virtually overnight. So what does that mean? For starters, if you like Wi-Fi, that is a lot more. And cheers for that. But the power of unlicensed goes beyond on-ramps to the internet and offloading for unlicensed services. It is the power of setting aside more of our airwaves for experiment and innovation without license. It is bound to yield new and exciting developments. It is also bound to be an economic boon. After all, the economic impact of unlicensed spectrum has been estimated at $140 billion annually. And by any measure, that is a lot. So let's not stop here with the 5 gigahertz band. After all, good spectrum policy will always require a mix of licensed and unlicensed services, treating them as competing as a relic from the past, because going forward they are complementary, and more and more devices and services are bound to incorporate both. That means we need to continue to seize unlicensed spectrum opportunities across other bands. In the near term, that means we should develop the possibilities of using unlicensed bandwidth in the 3.5 gigahertz band. We should also find lawful ways to provide unlicensed services in the 600 megahertz spectrum band now used by broadcasters. But above all, we need to create more opportunities for combining the great power of mobility with the cool boss possibilities of sandbox experimentation. And I think unlicensed spectrum is the sweet spot where it starts. So thank you very much to the Office of Engineering and Technology, and a special thank you to our chief, Julie Knapp, who more than a year ago listened to me when I talked about the lower portion of the 5 gigahertz band when the rest of the world was talking about the upper portion of the 5 gigahertz band. And you didn't dismiss me for the lawyer I am. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, and thank you for uh, harping on Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Pye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I love Wi-Fi, and so does the American public. Consumer demand for high-speed wireless broadband is expected to increase ninefold over the next four years, with 64% of mobile data traffic handled by Wi-Fi and small cell networks. That means our Wi-Fi routers will have to handle about 4.8 exabytes of data every month in 2018. Now, I know what you're thinking. 4.8 exabytes, uh, carry the one. Isn't that equivalent to 702 libraries of Congress every month? And yes, you would be right. But what you might not realize is that it is also the same amount of data as 11.78 billion episodes of Magnum PI. Now, like Tom Selleck's mustache, that is impressive. 
Uh, now, no doubt foreseeing a resurgence in the popularity of 80s television, Congress in 2012 told the commission to consider additional unlicensed use in the 5 gigahertz band. The band is tailor-made for the next generation of Wi-Fi. Its propagation characteristics minimize interference in the band, and its wide contiguous blocks allow for extremely fast connections, with throughput reaching and exceeding 1 gigabit per second as I saw for myself when I visited Qualcomm's headquarters in San Diego in 2012. Now, because the 802.11ac technical standard is already set, liberalizing our 5 gigahertz rules can have an immediate impact on the speed and price of consumer devices. And taking this step will allow consumers to make greater use of the hundreds of thousands of Wi-Fi hotspots that the cable industry is deploying throughout the United States. So I'm pleased to approve today's order, which allows greater unlicensed use of the 5 gigahertz band. And I'm especially pleased that we are moving forward with our revisions to our rules now, rather than uh, waiting until the thornier questions can be resolved. This is precisely the path that I outlined for the commission last summer. Tackle the easier issues presented first. Raise the power limits for Uni1 devices, remove the indoor only restriction, and harmonize some of our rules for the Uni bands. I'm glad that my colleagues agreed that this was the right way forward. But, as my colleagues have pointed out thus far, we can't rest on our laurels. If we are to keep pace with consumer expectations, we need more 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi spectrum, not just better use of existing 5 gigahertz spectrum. We must redouble our efforts on making an additional 195 megahertz of spectrum available for unlicensed use. Now, achieving this goal will not be without its challenges. For all the talk of spectrum sharing, the federal government has dragged out the process for evaluating new unlicensed use in the 5 gigahertz band. But I'm confident that common sense will eventually prevail and that consumers at some point will enjoy the greater bandwidth, reduced congestion, and cheaper devices that increased use of the 5 gigahertz band can bring. In closing, I would like to thank the numerous commission staff who worked on this item, especially the Office of Engineering and Technology. Chief Julie Knapp, Bruce Romano, Eoli Wilkins, Jerry Matisse, Mark Settle, Karen Ansari, Karen Rackley, and Naveed Gulshai. Uh, thank you for your work on this item and for all the work you do each and every day on behalf of the American people. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's item magnifies the importance of unlicensed spectrum in our modern communications landscape. In my time working for Senator John Sununu, I had the privilege of working with Senator Maria Cantwell and her great staff to advance a number of unlicensed measures, including opening up the television white spaces. The beauty of unlicensed spectrum, I learned, is that no one can predict with certainty what it will be ultimately used for, but it's a very safe bet that some of its uses will be far exceed expectations or even become game changers. If you want to meet the true innovators and entrepreneurs in spectrum policy, Talk to the men and women in the unlicensed community. They can literally turn trash into treasure. Take, for example, the former garbage bands of 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 5.8 gigahertz. Once thought of as unusable, the FCC opened up these bands to unlicensed use in the 1980s, and today they are some of the most valuable bands in the world, hosting popular wireless services, uh, including Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, Bluetooth wireless. Broadband providers use these bands to expand broadband services to harder to reach parts of America. And some cable operators are devoting substantial funds to deploy Wi-Fi networks to provide consumers with fast and reliable broadband service. As Americans demand more mobile data and faster speeds, the Commission will have to find additional unlicensed spectrum to accommodate the growth in Wi-Fi. The 5 gigahertz band propagation characteristics and the new 802.11 AC standard make it ideal for this purpose. That is why I'm pleased to join my excuse me, pleased to join my colleagues in approving this order. The action we take today will permit outdoor use in Uni1 band and harmonize power levels with those in the Uni3 band. This harmonization will allow consumers to benefit from new Wi-Fi standard that will increase data speeds. It's important to remember that our work remains, that more work remains in other parts of the band to further increase unlicensed use, and I hope to see a separate order on this point soon. Finally, I would like to express my appreciation to the staff in the Office of Engineering and Technology. We ask a lot of OAT in many different contexts. Here, 
OET acted as negotiator, mediator, and referee, carefully analyzing, accepting, and dismissing, as appropriate, select arguments relating to the Uni One band. And I want to thank them so much. Well done, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, you know, let me pick up where Commissioner O'Reilly and where everybody uh, here has, has commented and saying thank you to uh, OET, Julie, Aoli, Karen. Thank you for what you have done. I think Commissioner O'Reilly did a great job of identifying the multiple hats you've had to wear to pull this off. Um, you know, discussion today has, has ranged from Hedy Lamar to Tom Selleck. Um, but the reality is this is a really big deal. Um, that uh, this is new. Op this opens all kinds of new opportunities for uh, entrepreneurs uh, and innovators, as well as to relieving the congestion that you spoke about. Um, I wanted to describe this order as um, spinning straw into gold, but I think Commissioner Riley had the better yeah. description of trash into treasure. Um, but uh, but 100 megahertz at 5 gigahertz um, that was presently barely usable and not at all usable outdoors is a big deal. And um, this item transforms the spectrum from virtually unusable into usable for Wi-Fi. And just to put it in perspective, we've all been talking about the impact of, uh, of Wi-Fi. There is more spectrum here in 100 megahertz than in the amount of spectrum that was initially used for, uh, for Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi's stimulated Wi-Fi's growth. So it is a big deal. Faster connections, less um, congestion, uh, all make it easier to get online, and the potential here for gigabit Wi-Fi that gets opened up for really high-speed high Wi-Fi is significant. As all of us here have expressed, we are firm believers in unlicensed spectrum and in the need to continue to grow uh, unlicensed in multiple other bands. So um, again, thank you to the team uh, at OET. And if there are no further comments, I will ask my uh, colleagues to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, the request for editorial privileges is granted. Madam Secretary, please lead us to the next item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the next item will be presented by the Wireless <coughs> Telecommunications Bureau. It is entitled Amendment of the Commission's Rules with Regard to Commercial Operations in the 1695 to 1710 megahertz, 1755 to 1780 megahertz, and 2155 to 2180 megahertz bands. Roger, are you leading the party here? Yes. Mr. Sherman, it's all over to you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. It's my pleasure to introduce this report and order, which would help meet our growing demand for wireless broadband by making 65 megahertz of spectrum available for flexible use services. As Wireless Bureau staff will explain in further detail, the report and order establishes allocation, licensing, technical, and other service rules for the so-called AWS-3 bands. I'm joined at the table by Julie Knapp, Chief of OET, John Leibovitz, Deputy Chief of the Wireless Bureau, Blaise Sinto, the Chief of the Broadband Division, Peter Duranco, the Deputy Chief of the Broadband Division, Janet Young, a Senior Engineer in the Broadband Division, Genevieve Ross, an Attorney in the Broadband Division, and I think I saw Brian Regan as well, a Legal Advisor in the front office. Uh, in addition to the team at the table, I'd like to thank the staff of the Broadband Division, other divisions of WTB, OET, and OGC, of course, for expert contributions to this item. Jenny will present the item for the Commission. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I am pleased to present to you today the AWS 3 report and order, an item that will significantly increase the nation's supply of spectrum for advanced wireless services, including mobile broadband. The report and order establishes technical, auctions, and licensing rules for 50 megahertz of paired spectrum 
at 1755 to 1780 megahertz and 2155 to 2180 megahertz and 15 megahertz of unpaired spectrum at 1695 to 1710 megahertz. The report in order represents a critical step in implementing Congress's directive in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 that the Commission grant new initial licenses for these spectrum bands through a system of competitive bidding by February 2015. Getting to the AWS 3 auction, which we anticipate will begin in the fall, will depend on an unprecedented level of cooperation between corporate, between commercial and government stakeholders. The 1695 to 1710 megahertz band and 1755 to 1780 megahertz band will be made available on a shared basis with federal incumbent operations in the band. The report in order designates these two bands for uplink operations subject to successful coordination with federal incumbents. Additional coordination details will become available prior to the auction. The 1755 to 1780 MHz and 2155 to 2180 megahertz spectrum will be offered in a mix of geographic area licenses and spectrum block sizes, including one 5, five megahertz paired block licensed by cellular market area, two paired 5 megahertz blocks licensed by economic area, and one paired 10 megahertz block licensed by economic area. The 1695 to 1710 megahertz band will be offered in two spectrum blocks, one 5 megahertz and one 10 megahertz, and both will be licensed by economic area. The report and order also establishes a basic interoperability requirement. Any device that operates on any frequency in the 1755 to 1780 megahertz range must be capable of operating on all the AWS 1 and AWS 3 frequencies in the 1710 to 1780 frequency range paired with 2110 to 2180 megahertz. With an assurance of basic interoperability, potential licensees, especially smaller ones, will face less uncertainty over the development of a healthy device ecosystem. Finally, the item adopts a variety of other service rules addressing matters such as performance requirements, cost sharing, secondary markets, license term, and renewal criteria. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. With this order, the Commission expedites the allocation of flexible use spectrum so wireless providers can better satisfy the ever-increasing consumer demand for mobile broadband services. The initiative to pair the 1755 to 1780 and 2155 to 2180 bands has been a painstaking effort involving the wireless industry, federal agencies, and NAB that has spanned several years. But there is nothing like a federal statute with a tight deadline for licensing spectrum to encourage parties to reassess what really matters, find common ground, and do the right thing for the American public. I commend all relevant stakeholders who helped us reach this point. My review of the policy decisions in this order begins with the trends we are seeing in the mobile wireless market. Each year, the percentage of American adults who are cutting the cord and relying solely on mobile is increasing. For those living below the poverty line, you've heard me refer to this figure of 56%. And robust competition is the best way to provide them with affordable choices. But consolidation, secondary market transactions, and difficult investment markets have substantially reduced the number of competitive options for consumers. For example, in the 2006 AWS 1 auction, 104 bidders won 1,087 licenses. Now, four carriers hold 1,000 of those licenses. After carefully considering all of the arguments on the ban plan, I was more persuaded by the view that smaller block sizes and license areas could enhance competition, and yes, I would have preferred a different ban plan. However, the effort to repurpose federal spectrum for commercial use 
requires compromise. And in addition to promoting competition, we must consider other policy goals, including the fact that the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act requires us to design an auction which returns 110% of the total estimated relocation cost of federal users. Since future efforts to repurpose spectrum will involve more difficult policy issues, compromise will become increasingly important going forward. I appreciate Chairman Wheeler's decision to propose an alternative plan that better addresses the concerns of smaller providers. I am also pleased that the order mandates interoperability between AWS-1 and AWS-3 bands and has very strong language promoting a voluntary solution for interoperability with the AWS-4 band. For these reasons, I am voting to approve today's order. I want to acknowledge Roger Sherman, Ruth Milkman, Julie Knapp, and all former Wireless Bureau and OET chiefs whose efforts over the years are finally coming to fruition. I could not complete this statement today without acknowledging the very hard work of my advisor, Louis Peretz. Thank you so much, uh, Louis, for all of your wise counsel. To those who were involved in negotiating with federal agencies and crafting the important service and technical rules in this order, well done. As the order makes clear, more work is necessary before we can auction and license this spectrum so there is no west for the weary. In addition to setting auctions procedures, we should also give the public as much information as possible about geographic areas that will require coordination with federal operators. I know you will approach these tasks with the same diligence and skill that you have shown so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosewarson. Well, as the chairman might say, this is a big deal. <laughs> It was 2008, the last time the Commission conducted an auction this significant. Think about that. Our last major auction was conducted when the iPhone was in its infancy. We were giddy over our ability to tap on a screen, any screen, and expect an Internet-enabled response based on the swipe of a finger. Before streaming video in our palms and our laps had become commonplace before the application's economy grew to provide more than 750,000 jobs. It was a long time ago. But in the intervening years, we were not asleep at the switch. Congress took steps to clear spectrum used by federal authorities and directed this agency to put it to new commercial use. So as a result of their efforts in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, we can sit here today and tee up an auction of 65 megahertz of prime spectrum. Our auctions, however, do not take place in a vacuum. Even after all the bids are in, after all the winners are decided, there is a lot of work to do before consumers see the benefits. So it's worth noting that our efforts today are designed to speed this along. Through interoperability requirements, we are lowering the barriers to developing equipment for this new spectrum. By encouraging broader interoperability in the 2180 to 2200 megahertz band, we are facilitating the deployment of an additional 40 megahertz of spectrum. This is good stuff, designed to make it possible to put the benefits of these airwaves in the hands of consumers in ways that are faster, smarter, and sooner. But the promise of this proceeding goes even further. Because if we get this right, we will also substantially fund the first nationwide interoperable wireless broadband network for first responders, the First Responders Network Authority, even before we start our upcoming incentive auctions. Now, this is important. It means we can finally deliver on the promise of the 9-11 Commission recommendations and give our public safety officials a start on the network they need to keep us safe. Moreover, funding this network through these auctions now will free the Commission to develop more robust incentives in our incentive auction later. So there's a lot here to celebrate. But as far as we have come, we also need to keep an eye on where we are going next. Because the demand for Spectrum since we held a last major auction in 2008 has skyrocketed, and it shows no signs of stopping. Yet freeing the next swath of federal airwaves will not come easy. We can, of course, continue on our current course. 
When commercial wireless demands rise, we can ask Congress to go to our federal partners and press them to find new ways to repurpose old airwaves for new commercial use. But as every one of us involved in this proceeding knows all too well, our three-step process, clearing federal users, relocating them, and then auctioning the cleared spectrum for new use is growing mighty creaky. It just takes far too long. That is why it's time for a fresh approach to federal spectrum. We need a policy built on carrots, not sticks. We need to develop a series of incentives to serve as the catalyst for freeing more federal spectrum for commercial use. Across the board, we have to find ways to reward federal authorities for efficient use of spectrum. They could be straightforward and financial, under which a certain portion of the revenue from the commercial auction of their previously held spectrum would be reserved for the federal entity releasing the spectrum. They could also involve revenue opportunities from leasing or shared access, including during a period of transition to cleared rights. As part of this effort, we should consider evaluation of all spectrum used by federal authorities in order to provide a consistent way to reward efficiency. In short, we will make smarter use of a scarce resource if federal authorities see benefit in commercial reallocation rather than just loss. Now the good news is that these kind of ideas are gaining steam. The administration added a batch of new initiatives in the spectrum policy mix in last year's executive memorandum on expanding America's leadership in wireless innovation. In Congress, Representative Matsui and Representative Guthrie introduced a groundbreaking bipartisan bill that provides a framework for rewarding federal spectrum users for efficient use. This is a terrific bill that could have big impact. Of course, this is getting ahead of what we have right here, right now, right here today. But we need to look for new spectrum opportunities down the road, well before we have the auction of this 65 megahertz in the rear view mirror. Given the speed at which our wireless world is evolving, I don't think now is a moment too soon. So thank you to the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for your hard work on this important auction and all of your spectrum auctions yet to come. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Mr. Pai. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin where I typically finish, and that is to express my gratitude to the Commission staff, many of whom are arrayed before us. I am keenly aware of the challenges that you have faced in this process. In fact, if you dig into the Commission's email archives, you will find from the better part of a decade ago emails from a former OGC staffer expressing skepticism that uh, this point ever would be reached. Uh, so I appreciate all that you have done. Just save us the effort. Who might that be? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you, like everyone else, will have to file the FOIA request. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll save you the trouble. It'll be me. It was me. Um, but I do appreciate all you've done to get us where we are. And where are we? Uh, well, as the Vice President might say, this is a big... Okay. Well, um, <laughs> a big deal. Yes, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, for after five years without a major spectrum auction, we are starting to turn things around. Last month, the Commission auctioned the uh, long fallow H-block spectrum. And today, we adopt service rules so that we can auction off the AWS-3 spectrum before the year is over. This is good news. It's good news because consumer demand for mobile broadband services has never been greater. And new commercial spectrum is needed to fuel the investment that has made the United States the world leader in wireless innovation. This is also good news because spectrum auctions can raise billions of dollars for national priorities identified by Congress in the Spectrum Act. Among those priorities are funding for state and local first responders, public safety research, deficit reduction, and next generation 911 deployment, not to mention the funding of FirstNet. We need to raise at least $27.95 billion in net revenues if we are going to meet all of those challenges. There's even more good news. We are using the right type of auction to sell off the right spectrum. On the former point, we are maintaining open eligibility and uncapped participation, consistent with the Commission's firmly rooted standard that sets a high bar to any bidding restrictions. 
in a long line of commission cases, we have determined that eligibility restrictions may be imposed, quote, only when open eligibility would pose a significant likelihood of substantial harm to competition in specific markets, and when an eligibility restriction would be effective in eliminating that harm, unquote. On the latter part, the right spectrum, we have paired the 1755 to 17 megahertz band with the 2155 to 2180 megahertz band, which is adjacent to the existing AWS-1 band and is already internationally harmonized for commercial use. Those characteristics should mean faster deployment and more efficient use of spectrum. Together, these choices make it more likely that we will have, quote, robust competition maximizing revenue through vigorous auction participation, as called for by the leaders of the bipartisan Congressional Spectrum Caucus. But there are a couple of catches. We are not clearing federal users out of the AWS-3 uh, spectrum, and we are giving the government greater access to 85 megahertz of prime commercial spectrum at 2025 to 2110 megahertz. We do this despite the fact that the federal government is already the sole or dominant user of more than half the spectrum ideally suited for mobile broadband. That's almost 1,300 megahertz of spectrum where, as the President's Council on Advisors on Science and Technology put it, government exclusivity or dominance, quote, effectively precludes substantial commercial use, unquote. This is bad news for the American public. For the best way to maximize the value of spectrum in these bands, both at auction and for consumers, is to make it available for exclusive commercial use. That's what we did in the early 2000s, when the FCC and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA, cleared federal users out of the 1710 to 1755 megahertz band and conduct conducted the tremendously successful AWS-1 auction. Clearing that spectrum actually cost less than originally assumed, even without giving the government new spectrum to use. So consumers got more spectrum, and the Treasury got more funds. And since that time, Congress has placed even greater emphasis on clearing. In fact, in a subsection titled Relocation Prioritized Over Sharing, the Spectrum Act directs the NTIA to, quote, choose options involving shared use only when it determines, in consultation with the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, that relocation is not feasible because of technical or cost constraints. And if NTIA makes that determination, under the law, it must, quote, notify Congress of the determination, including the specific technical or cost constraints on which the determination is based. Now, consistent with these statutory requirements, the AWS-3 and PRM proposed to allocate the 1695 to 1710 megahertz band and the 1755 to 1780 megahertz bands for shared use only if clearing is not feasible. The NTIA has not yet carried out these statutory duties. Although the Commission commenced the notification and auction process under the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act more than one year ago, NTIA has not yet notified Congress of its determination, assuming that one has been made in consultation with OMB. And it's far from clear, uh, it's far from certain whether clearing the 1755 to 1780 megahertz band was ever seriously considered under the Spectrum Act standard. As the Commission readily acknowledges in this order, NTIA charged the Com Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee, or CSMAC, working groups with addressing sharing issues related to the spectrum at hand, not clearing. It also directed those groups to use NTIA's fast track report as, quote, the bases for beginning, unquote, their discussions, even though that report was prepared to assess the feasibility of sharing, not clearing. And on the heels of this directive came the PCAST report, which largely dismissed clearing as an option, as I noted at the time. These decisions beg the unfortunate question of whether the law is effectively a dead letter. And none of this is to say that clearing and relocating federal users is easy. I'm the first to acknowledge that. Federal agencies are focused on achieving their missions, and they often lack incentives to relocate and clear spectrum for commercial use. But whatever the challenges, 
The statute favors clearing, not sharing. Creativity, not resignation. The fact that NTIA has yet to publicly determine that clearing these bans is not feasible puts us in a tight spot. We have a statutory deadline to auction and license the AWS-3 band, so we need to move forward with service rules so that wireless operators can begin planning their bids. But coming up with service rules requires a fair degree of clarity on the status of federal holdings. And getting that clarity in turn requires extensive communications with numerous federal users, with NTIA as the go-between. So we end up in sort of a game of telephone, made worse because we typically have to accept the government's say-so on the details of federal use. I hope we may find a better way, but for now, we must simply muddle through. I thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for accommodating some of my suggestions, such as including in this item a mechanism that would allow us to monitor the progress being made by those federal incumbents that are relocating. And as we move closer to auctioning this spectrum, I look forward to working with them to ensure that federal incumbents provide thorough, substantive, and substantiated transition plans. The potential licensees must have adequate information about the nature and extent of incumbent operations in order to value the spectrum and formulate possible bids. Finally, I cannot approve of the order's adoption of an interoperability mandate on AWS-3 licensees, given that the AWS-3 NPRM never proposed such a rule, as would be required under the Administrative Procedure Act. Nevertheless, because that mandate only spans the 1710 to 1780 megahertz, and 2110 to 2180 megahertz bands, and because international standards to cover those bands are already being developed, I view that error as harmless. So thanks once again to my colleagues, thanks to the Commission's staff, and thanks for all those in the commercial sector who are about to make the AWS 3 auction, we hope, a tremendous success. We're grateful to you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we take another step to implement the Spectrum Act contained in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 by making available to the commercial marketplace an additional 65 megahertz of much needed spectrum. I'm especially pleased that this order will enable us to auction 1755 to 1780 megahertz paired with 2155 to 2180 megahertz. These bands are not only ideal for wireless broadband, they're also globally harmonized, which means consumers stand to benefit as U.S. providers take advantage of the economies of scale and network equipment and overseas roaming. In the same vein, I would have preferred that we auction the uplink 1695 to 1710 paired with a downlink band, and if necessary, had gone back to Congress to ask for a limited delay to achieve this, potentially generating more value for both the industry and auction proceeds. I appreciate the comments from my fellow commissioner, Commissioner Rosenworcel, uh, on ways to get carrots and sticks to federal government agencies. Uh, I must admit, I uh, spent a part of my life uh, trying to find bigger sticks as the carrots didn't always work. Well, I'm pleased that we have uh, reached a resolution on the major decisions that will enable us to move forward with this auction, I'm concerned about the remaining issues that we still need to be resolved. To ensure that Americans can realize the most, uh, the most benefit from the spectrum, the FCC and NTA should continue to decrease the number and the size of the areas where AWS-3 licenses must coordinate during the relocation process and beyond. I'm concerned about some of the remaining details surrounding the auction itself. The law states, in order for AWS a three auction to be successful, it will have to generate enough revenues to cover 110% of the relocation costs. For those funds to be raised, auction participants need certainty in order to have the confidence to bid freely. Most importantly, they will need to know how the spectrum screen will apply to this auction. The item punts this question to the mobile spectrum holdings proceeding. There are also a few aspects uh, of this order upon which I must concur. First, I believe that the appointed and confirmed commissioners should decide issues of importance before the commission. In response to concerns about the number of decisions that were possibly delegated to the bureau level, the final item no longer contains any reference to delegated authority and leaves those decisions to be made to a future date. 
having just gone through a number of instances when I requested to vote on an item, only to have it go out on delegated authority anyway, I remain skeptical that I will have the opportunity to vote on the upcoming decisions regarding AWS 3. Excessive reliance on delegation demeans the credibility of this commission. In addition, I do not support the item's discussion of extending interoperability to the AWS 4 band. Without adopting rules, the commission here is telling industry Absent technical impediments, we do not expect or we expect them to implement interoperability. If they do not, or if the Commission determines, determines that progress on interoperability has stalled in the standards process, the Commission may regulate. This is nothing more than stealth regulation. It just avoids the notice problems. I thank the dedicated staff of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and the Office of Engineering and Technology who made great strides in their negotiations with NTA and the other affected agencies to get us here today. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, as we have all heard, um, this is important, an important piece of spectrum. This is Gold Coast uh, spectrum that is right next to the AWS One uh, band, which is the workhorse of mobility uh, today. Uh, and as we've also heard, getting to this point has not been easy. And so we need to give credit to our federal partners uh, in this, uh, NTIA, DOD, uh, Department of Justice, the White House, uh, Capitol Hill, uh, and, and NOAA. Uh, for their uh, their activities which brought us to this point. Parting with Spectrum is an unnatural act uh, and we're grateful to our federal colleagues for uh, pursuing uh, those kinds of opportunities. Yet we recognize um, that the hard work is not yet over. Um, that there are details that have to be worked out about protection zones and about coordination um, that um, will affect our ability to hold the auction in the designated time. Uh, in, in other words, the clock is ticking on this, and we need to, uh, to resolve that uh, together with our uh, federal partners. Um, we begin a process today that allows the industry, the bidders, um, to prepare for an auction. Uh, our executive branch colleagues and we must quickly resolve the all-important technical details that must be finalized before that auction can actually uh, take place. I believe that we will reach those resolutions um, and that they will be put out in a public notice. Um, and, um, and so I'm quite hopeful, optimistic, that we will be able to move ahead uh, to the auctions. Uh, but this is a huge step towards the auctions in the fall. We will work hard uh, to take the necessary next steps. Our colleagues uh, in the executive branch, I know, will work hard as well. And along with my colleagues up here, uh, I want to thank everybody who has worked with this. Jenny, that was a terrific presentation that you made. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and to Roger uh, and John, who I know has spent endless hours uh, negotiating with our colleagues. Thank you very much to you all. Uh, Blaze, Peter, Janet, Julie, everybody, thank you for all that you have done. Uh, and if there are no uh, further comments, I'll move to a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The uh, request for editorial privileges is granted. And so, Madam Secretary, will you please guide us to the next item? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the final two items on your agenda today will be presented by the Media Bureau. The next item is entitled, Amendment of the Commission's Rules Related to Retransmission Consent. And as the Media Bureau files in, look at this. We note for the record that Bill Lake, oh, he does have a card in front of him. You were putting him. I was going to say, you don't need any introduction. You don't have to have a card in front of you. Do you want to, Mr. Lake, you want to lead us through this? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Media Bureau presents a report and order that strengthens our retransmission consent rules. It is accompanied by a further notice that seeks comment on whether to eliminate or modify 
the TV network non-duplication and syndicated exclusivity rules. Congress created the retransmission consent regime in 1992. Pay TV companies may retransmit broadcast signals only with the broadcaster's consent, and both sides are negotiated are required to negotiate for that in good faith. We have seen significant changes in the video marketplace since we adopted our initial rules implementing the retransmission consent regime. The Commission began this proceeding to consider how its rules might be updated in light of these changes. The item before you helps to ensure that retransmission consent negotiations will be fair and effective. Joining me at the table are the drafters of the item, Raylan Remy, Diana Sokolow, and Kathy Berthot of the Bureau's Policy Division. Raylan will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we are pleased to present this report in order and further notice of proposed rulemaking in the Commission's retransmission consent proceeding. Among other actions, the report in order strengthens the Commission's rules governing good faith negotiation by prohibiting competing top four television broadcast stations from jointly negotiating retransmission consent agreements. Specifically, the order amends our rules to provide that it is a violation of the statutory duty to negotiate in good faith for a broadcast station that is ranked among the top four stations in a market to negotiate retransmission consent agreements jointly. If the stations serve the same geographic market and are not commonly owned, Adopting a prohibition on these joint negotiations serves the public interest by promoting competition among top four broadcast stations for carriage of their signals and the associated retransmission consent revenues. The order finds that prohibiting joint negotiation by top four stations is justified by economic analyses and empirical data. Economic analyses indicate that coordinated negotiation of retransmission consent agreements by competing top four stations gives those stations both the incentive and the ability to impose on multi-channel video programming distributors or MVPDs higher fees for retransmission consent than they otherwise could impose if the stations conducted carriage negotiations independently. Same market top four stations are considered by an MVPD to be at least partial substitutes for one another. Their joint negotiation prevents an MVPD from taking advantage of the competition or substitution among the stations to hold retransmission consent payments down. As a result, the jointly negotiating top four stations can obtain higher retransmission consent fees because the threat of losing the programming of two or more top four stations at the same time gives those stations undue bargaining leverage in negotiations with MVPDs. Significantly, the record shows that where a single entity controls retransmission consent negotiations for more than one top four station in a market, the average retransmission consent fees paid for such stations is approximately 20 to 40 percent higher than the fees paid for other top four stations in those markets. The order finds that by preventing supra-competitive increases in retransmission consent fees, a prohibition on joint negotiation by top four stations may also limit any resulting pressure for retail price increases for subscription video services. To target collusive behavior effectively, the order defines joint negotiation to encompass various types of coordinated activities relating to retransmission consent. The rule we adopt prohibits not only agreements that are legally binding, but also less formal methods of coordination between or among same market, separately owned top four stations. The record in this proceeding does not contain evidence warranting adoption of a similar ban with respect to joint negotiation by non-top four stations. We will, however, consider such evidence if it is presented in the future. The item also includes a further notice of proposed rulemaking. The further notice seeks comment on whether to eliminate or modify the network non-duplication and syndicated exclusivity rules in light of changes in the video marketplace since these rules were first adopted more than 40 years ago. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clyburn. I am pleased to support the Chairman on this order addressing the issue of joint retransmission negotiations. 
in 2011, the average bill for paid television was $86 per month. By 2015, the same average is expected to reach $123, reflecting an annual retail rate increase of about 6%. While consumer income and spending have remained relatively flat, and the inflation rate has risen only by 1.5%, cable companies claim programming costs are increasing by 8, 10% per year, mostly due to retransmission consent negotiations. Although the amendments to the Act in 1992 gave broadcasters the ability to charge fees for content that is free over the airwaves, Section 325 states that broadcasters are prohibited from failing to negotiate retransmission consent in good faith. Many of the larger broadcast companies already own stations in a number of markets that do not compete with each other and have more leverage to negotiate large retransmission fees. But when it comes to top four stations separately owned within the same market, essentially competitors, joint negotiation may violate the good faith clause. When top broadcasters in the same market negotiate higher prices or threaten to pull the plug, MVPDs, both large and small, basically have no choice. And where do those extra fees come from? The consumer's pockets. As for the further notice of proposed rulemaking on the non-duplication rule, I look forward to a full record on this issue, but believe in upholding the rule because it promotes competition and localism. I pre appreciate all of the good work from the Media Bureau, the Office of General Counsel, the Chairman's Office, and my staff on this item. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosworth. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say few Americans have ever heard of the term retransmission consent. It's one of those wonky and lawyerly things we bandy about in these halls and in this town. Fewer still know that more than two decades ago, Congress prohibited retransmitting a broadcast television station signal without the station's consent, and at the same time directed parties negotiating for this consent to do so in good faith. But far too many Americans know what happens when retransmission consent negotiations go wrong. First, it's pretty clear to consumers that something is not right when they turn on the television for news, their favorite show, or the game, and instead get saddled with a dark screen. They may not know how and why retransmission consent negotiations between broadcasters and their cable or satellite company have failed, but they know a blackout means they are not getting the programming they paid for. When this happens, I think they are owed a refund. Second, it is pretty clear to consumers that what they pay for television programming packages goes up too far and too fast. I am under no illusion that retransmission consent is the main driver of increased programming costs, but it is a piece of a larger system that deserves attention. So it is for these two reasons, the incidence of extended blackouts and the creep upward of rates that I support today's action. By limiting joint negotiations by local broadcasters, I am hopeful we can reduce the extent of retransmission consent blackouts. I am also hopeful we can help keep consumer rates more level. Because the record reflects that when stations jointly negotiate, retransmission consent fees are higher and those higher charges get passed on to consumers. So I think our efforts today are a good development, not only because I am a regulator, but because I watch and I pay bills too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner. Commissioner Pai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when it comes to retransmission consent negotiations, I, perhaps inspired by the Chairman's example, take uh, counsel from two wise communications experts, Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock, whose hit song reminds us it takes two to make a thing go right. <coughs> After carefully reviewing the record, and meeting with numerous parties to this proceeding, I have concluded that good faith retransmission consent negotiations generally involve two parties, one multi-channel video programming distributor, or MVPD, and one broadcast company. Adding a third or fourth party to the mix raises troubling competitive concerns. Accordingly, I am pleased to support today's item. 
The order states that the joint negotiation of retransmission consent agreements by separately owned top four stations in the same market violates the statutory duty to negotiate in good faith. Now, to be sure, such joint negotiations may bring some benefits. But given that re the retransmission consent negotiations usually occur only once every three years, the cost savings are, at best, intermittent and do not compare with the efficiencies produced by television stations, sharing sales staff, or other backroom operations. And in my judgment, the harms outweigh any such benefits. The record indicates that joint negotiations may result in super competitive uh, increases in retransmission consent fees. This suggests that such conduct is collusive and could be prohibited under the Sherman Act. The anti-competitive potential for joint negotiations here is only amplified by the regulatory context for video carriage, including the compulsory copyright license, network non-duplication rule, and syndicated exclusivity rule. Also critical to my vote is that the Commission today carefully remains within its limited authority over retransmission consent. Section 325 of the Communications Act instructs the FCC to enact regulations to prohibit a television broadcast station or MVPD from failing to negotiate in good faith. And this provision allows the Commission to proscribe certain negotiating tactics in order to ensure good faith negotiations between broadcast stations and MVPDs such as refusing to res respond to a retransmission consent proposal. But it does not give the Commission the power to mandate the substantive outcome of retransmission consent negotiations. This will remain the case after today's vote. I particularly appreciate my colleagues' willingness to incorporate many of my suggestions into this item. I am especially pleased that today we are not extending the so-called sweeps prohibition to direct broadcast satellite providers. The record did not reveal a need for such regulation, and we should not impose new regulatory mandates where there is not a concrete problem to be solved. Finally, I support the Commission's decision to seek additional comment on whether we should eliminate or modify our network non-duplication and syndicated exclusivity rules. In particular, I encourage parties to focus their feedback on whether the interests these rules are designed to promote can and should be protected through private contractual arrangements, or whether the compulsory copyright license would render such a scheme unworkable. A many thanks to the Media Bureau for its efforts. I am cognizant of the fact that it took many more than two to make this item out of sight, and so I'm particularly uh, grateful for the efforts of Raylan Remy, Bill Lake, Kathy Berthot, and Diane Sokolow, uh, among others, including Michelle Carey, Nancy Murphy, Mary Beth Murphy, and Stephen Brockert. Uh, for this recovering antitrust lawyer and a staffer on the 2007 MDU order, the item truly was a pleasure to read. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item seeks to improve the retransmission consent process between television broadcasters and MVPDs. The order acts upon evidence in the record that joint negotiations between two top four non-commonly owned broadcast stations in a market raises retransmission consent fees above market rates. It therefore adds such activity to the list in our rules of per se good faith violations. While well, I find the record somewhat thin, and it may not have gone in the same directions if I had the pen, the item adds, the item aims to shield consumers from unreasonable fee increases, and I'm willing to support it. I do so with a reservation that while we have legal authority to act, this order partially relies on one provision that is unnecessary. Similarly, I support the further notice, but keep an open mind and do not subscribe at this time to any particular tentative conclusions or proposed legal authority. I am sympathetic to the argument that it may not be necessary for the Commission to continue to enforce network non-dupe or syndex rules when these can be addressed through private contracts. These are complicated questions, and I hope a full record from interested parties will help clarify the Commission's responsibility and consumers' best interests in this area. Finally, this item is the result of a tremendous amount of hard work. I thank the Chairman, his ex excellent staff, and the Media Bureau for their time and willingness to incorporate many of my feedback. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. So we're dealing with a lot of very important issues uh, today. but. 
none will grab the attention of consumers uh, more than this effort to mitigate the impact they feel from the rising cost of video services. Um, as my colleagues have pointed out, Congress created retransmission consent over 20 years ago and intended it to be a one-on-one -on -one negotiation between a broadcaster and an MVPD. And today we are returning the practice to Congress's intent uh, by prohibiting the top four broadcasters from leveraging each other to increase fees. Uh, make no mistake about it, Congress said broadcasters should be able to charge fees, and all we're doing today is leveling the negotiating table. Uh, thank you to Diana and Kathy and Raylan and, as always, to Bill Lake for your leadership uh, on this issue. And I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, the uh, record will uh, remain open, and the request for editorial privileges is granted. Uh, Madam Secretary, please announce our next item. Chairman and Commissioners, the last item on your agenda today is entitled 2014 Quadrennial Regulatory Review, Review of the Commission's Broadcast Ownership Rules and Other Rules Adopted Pursuant to Section 202 of the Telecommunications Act of 96, 2010 Quadrennial Regulatory Review, Review of the Commission's Broadcast Ownership Rules and Other Rules Adopted Pursuant to the Act, and Promotion, Diversification of Ownership in Broadcasting Services and Rules and Policies Concerning Attribution of Joint Sales Agreements in Local Television Markets. Thank you, Mr. Lake. You want to lead us through this? Yes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. We're here in force for this one, as you can thank see. You. Today we present to you for your adoption an item that addresses the Commission's broadcast ownership rules and our broadcast attribution rules. The further notice of proposed rulemaking included in today's item initiates the 2014 Quadrennial Media Ownership Review while incorporating the extensive record from the open 2010 Quadrennial Review. The further notice also seeks input on steps to remove and encourage to improve and encourage ownership diversity among new entrants, including small businesses. And it seeks input on a proposal to increase transparency with respect to local station sharing agreements. The report and order portion of today's item closes a loophole with respect to television joint sales agreements. These agreements have increasingly been used in a manner that frustrates the goals of our local television consolidation limits. The Commission has previously recognized that when a radio station arranges to sell advertising time on a competing station in the same market, it gains the ability and incentive to influence the station's programming and other core operations. For that reason, in the radio context, the Commission's rules have long treated an agreement for a station to sell 15 percent or more of the advertising time of another local station as an ownership interest what we call an attributable interest. We proposed years ago to align our television rules with our radio rules in this respect. Today's order does so. With me at the table today are Hillary DeNegro, Chief of the Industry Analysis Division, Martha Heller, Deputy Division Chief, Brendan Holland, Assistant Division Chief, and Julie Salavera, Jamila Best Johnson, and Benjamin Arden, attorneys in that division. Julie will present the broadcast ownership rules further notice. Jamila will present the diversity section of the notice. And Ben will present the proposals relating to joint sales agreements and sharing agreements. Thank you. The Commission examines its media ownership rules as required by statute to determine if they remain necessary in the public interest as the result of competition. The further notice before you initiates the 2014 proceeding and builds on the record of the ongoing 2010 proceeding. The item tentatively affirms that media ownership limits are necessary in the current marketplace despite the prevalence of, elect of new electronic media. It acknowledges that the media marketplace is in transition, particularly as a result of broadband internet. However, it recognizes the vital role that traditional outlets play in the media industry 
and notes that tens of millions of Americans still do not have broadband access to news and other programming on the internet. The notice analyzes each media ownership rule individually. With respect to the local TV ownership rule, it proposes to retain the rule, tentatively concluding that the rule promotes competition and comports with the Commission's goals of promoting viewpoint diversity, localism, and minority and female ownership. <coughs> the proposed rule would allow an entity to own up to two TV stations in the same DMA if the digital noise limited service contours of the stations do not overlap or where there is overlap, at least one of the stations is not ranked among the top four TV stations in the market and at least eight independently owned TV stations would remain in the DMA following the combination. The notice proposes to substitute the digital noise limited service contour in place of the analog grade B contour in determining overlaps to account for the transition to digital TV. It also proposes to retain the failed or failing station waiver standard and asks whether additional waiver criteria should be added. The item proposes to retain the local radio ownership rule without change. It tentatively concludes that the rule promotes competition and comports with the Commission's goals of promoting viewpoint diversity, localism, and minority and female ownership. The rule specifies the maximum number of commercial radio stations that one entity may own in a market depending on the size of the market. It also contains separate limits on the total numbers of AM stations and of FM stations that an entity may own in a market. The current newspaper broadcast cross ownership rule prohibits the common ownership of a newspaper and either a television station or a radio station when the analog contour of the station encompasses the newspaper's city of publication. Consistent with commission findings in prior proceedings, the notice tentatively concludes that a restriction on cross ownership should be retained to promote viewpoint diversity in local markets. However, as previously upheld by a reviewing court, it tentatively finds that the total ban on all newspaper broadcast cross ownership is overly broad. The notice seeks comment on whether the part of the rule prohibiting cross ownership of a newspaper with a radio station should be eliminated. Given that viewpoint diversity has been the sole justification for restricting newspaper radio combinations, the, news, the notice seeks comment on whether there is a sufficient legal basis to support retention of the prohibition. The notice tentatively concludes that the Commission should continue to ban combinations of newspapers and TV stations. It proposes to update the restriction to account for the digital TV transition. Instead of using a TV station's analog grade A contour to determine the geographic scope of the ban, the notice proposes to prohibit common ownership when the newspaper and the TV station are in the same DMA and the digital principal community contour of the TV station encompasses the community in which the newspaper is published. The notice seeks comment on whether to incorporate a waiver process into the rule. The Commission could consider waiver requests on a purely case-by-case -case basis or create a presumptive waiver standard that could, for example, favor newspaper television combinations in the top 20 DMAs if the TV station is not ranked among the top four TV stations in the DMA and at least eight independently owned and operated major media voices would remain. The radio television cross ownership rule limits the total combined number of TV and radio stations that can be commonly owned in a market. The notice asks whether the rule continues to be necessary to promote viewpoint diversity. Lastly, the item proposes to retain the dual network rule without change. That rule prohibits common ownership of two of the top four broadcast networks, namely ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Thank you, Julie. 
The further notice before you today addresses the remand of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in its Prometheus II decision regarding the Commission's efforts to encourage broadcast ownership diversity. In its 2008 diversity order, the Commission determined that use of its pre-existing eligible entity definition could further its goal of diversifying broadcast ownership. A licensee would meet the definition of an eligible entity if it qualified as a small business pursuant to Small Business Administration standards based on revenue. The Commission made eligible entities qualified to benefit from six specific measures intended to increase broadcast ownership among minorities and women. The Third Circuit vacated that part of the 2008 order. It ruled that the Commission had not shown a nexus between the revenue-based eligible entity definition and increasing minority and female ownership. The Commission suspended use of the eligible entity definition following the Prometheus II decision and sought comment on whether it should reinstate the eligible entity definition or adopt a different definition to facilitate ownership diversity. The further notice tentatively recommends reinstating the revenue-based eligible entity definition, emphasizing that the program would support new entry into the broadcast industry by small businesses. The Third Circuit further directed the Commission to evaluate whether use of a race or gender conscious <coughs> eligibility definition should be adopted to eliminate barriers and assist industry entry by minorities and women. On remand, we sought comment on this as well. The further notice discusses the high constitutional threshold for use of racial classifications by the government. It explains that such classifications are subject to strict scrutiny and will be held constitutional only if they are narrowly tailored to further a compelling governmental interest or to redress past racial discrimination. The notice tentatively concludes that promoting viewpoint diversity is a compelling government interest, but also tentatively concludes that the current record does not satisfy the prevailing legal standard supporting a racial or ethnic origin classification. Finally, the further notice examines a number of recommendations by commenters for increasing ownership opportunities for minorities and women. The item notes that some suggestions have been addressed by the Commission and some are currently under review. Thank you, Jamila. A final portion of the further notice is aimed at bringing greater transparency to the growing practice of agreements between independently owned television stations for the sharing of resources. The Commission seeks to improve its understanding of the impact of these agreements on station operations and on Commission policies. While these agreements provide for the sharing of a wide range of resources, such as studio facilities, a news helicopter, or back office functions, they are not currently subject to any comprehensive disclosure requirements. Thus, we in the public have no firm understanding of the breadth, content, or prevalence of sharing agreements between independently owned stations. This lack of information makes it hard for the Commission to know what significance these agreements may have for the Commission's policies. The further notice addresses this need by proposing a broad definition of shared service agreements, which is designed to identify all types of resource sharing and service agreements between stations that may be relevant to the Commission's <coughs> policymaking initiatives. The further notice tentatively concludes that disclosure of these agreements is necessary to better inform the Commission and the public, and it invites comment on the best way to achieve disclosure of these agreements. Today's further notice is accompanied by a report and order that deals with another type of agreement between stations, joint sales agreements, or JSAs, under which one station sells advertising time on another station. The report and order changes our rules to treat certain of these agreements as the equivalent of ownership interests for purposes of the broadcast ownership rules, thus bringing our treatment of television JSAs in line with radio JSAs. The focus of the Commission's attribution analysis is to identify those interests that give their holders a degree of influence or control such that the holders have a realistic potential to affect the programming decisions or other core operations of the licensee. The Commission's attribution rules define which interests in a licensee must be counted in applying the broadcast ownership rules. They are not ownership limits in themselves. The report and order attributes same market television JSAs in which the brokering station sells more than 15% of the brokered station's weekly advertising time. 
This threshold will provide stations with the ability to achieve cost savings through the joint sale of a small percentage of the station's advertising time, while limiting the potential of the brokering station to exert undue influence over the brokered station. Consistent with the Commission's earlier treatment of radio JSAs, the report and order provides a two-year transition period for parties to amend or terminate any JSAs that would result in a violation of the broadcast ownership limits or to otherwise come into compliance with the broadcast ownership rules. The report and order also notes that parties may seek a waiver if they believe the application of the Commission's rules to their particular circumstances would not serve the public interest. The Commission will carefully review and promptly consider any such request. The Bureau recommends adoption of the further notice and report and order and requests editorial privileges. Thank you to uh, all of you who have uh, worked so diligently on this very challenging uh, issue, but thank you to all of you. Commissioner Clyburn. True Southerners, Mr. Chairman, have a unique ability to turn lemons into lemonade, and that knack best reflects what I hope we've achieved in the matter before us today. JSAs and SSAs have been around for some time with the patent blessing of the FCC and are the backbone of growth and profits for many broadcasters. While most of these arrangements have resulted in enhanced economic returns through the selling of advertising, often by more experienced or seasoned sales forces, additional programming, most notably the production of local news, and access to state-of-the-art facilities for standalone stations that could never afford it on their own, JSAs and SSAs have not been without controversy. Some arrangements, quite frankly, were thought to be workarounds to our local ownership rules, and the Commission staff rightfully began to scrutinize these arrangements more closely. In doing so, we uncovered some glaring abuses. In some markets, JSAs masked a threadbare ownership structure where the brokered station owned little else beyond the FCC license. We found arrangements that mask full-scale control of the brokered stations right down to the same programming, the same talent, the same management, and the same studio. More egregiously, we have seen arrangements where the second station was little more than an orphan of the first, including veiled single ownership schemes. At stake are billions of dollars in revenues, capital investment, and plain old profits from independent station, television stations in second and third tier markets. On this issue, the economics are truly local. I am keenly aware of the impact of our actions on broadcasters, the effects on local communities, the reaction of capital markets and institutional investors, the present and future opportunities for minorities and small business entities, the concerns of public interest groups, and last but not least, the appropriate role of this agency as a regulator of last resort representing the public interest. This item has also required me to respond to questions from allies and opponents alike about the timing, intent, fundamental fairness of today's action. I am not sure whether all issues have been addressed satisfactorily, but in the course of our inquiry, we have un uncovered several new concerns raised by industry, public interest, and minority interest groups, as well as policymakers, which we seek to address today. To me, perhaps one of the most ironic and unexpected byproducts has been that the issue of diversity all of a sudden has risen in this debate. When it was initiated, I had no idea it would spawn such a heated dialogue on the value and importance of minority broadcast ownership. It is my sincere hope that this concern and expression of goodwill lives well beyond this item. For the past several weeks, I have been very clear that my support of any policy shift would only come with a responsible balance of competing interests. First. This item gives a licensee the opportunity to seek a waiver of our local television ownership rule if it can demonstrate that a JSA is in the public interest. For example, an applicant can demonstrate that a JSA would enable a school, community college, institution of higher education, or other 
community support organization to own a station and that the benefits of such common ownership would advance the public interest. Second, it establishes a shock clock of 90 days for the Bureau's review of waiver requests. I believe that if we're going to have a viable waiver process, we need to have definite set of rules concerning how those waivers are to be considered. This provides a level of predictability and certainty for licensees so that their transactions do not become mired in FCC purgatory. In itself, this is a significant step forward. Third, this item establishes guidelines for waivers, noting that if a waiver request for a JSA is limited in scope and duration, with a time frame for full operational control, it is more likely to secede than one that is open-ended. This should give smaller stations the amount of run runway they need to take off toward full independence. What we have here today is an item that is admittedly not perfect, nor will it be fully embraced by every stakeholder or interest group. But I, I am convinced of our earnestness and good faith to address the key issues involved in the media ownership debate. Responsible regulation requires balancing of interests. On the one hand, we must uphold those well-defined rules in order to realize our goals of promoting predictability and stability for markets, business owners, and investment, investors. On the other hand, there is a great value in the decision to uphold our statutory goals of localism, diversity, and competition. There is much more in this item, but in sum, I wish for it to be known that my objective from the beginning has been to promote licensees that want to advance local content in their area television markets, the incentive and framework to do so. And I am convinced that we can both enforce our rules and realize those, object those objectives that the statute directs if we simply pierce the veneer, abandon the platitudes, and embark on a legally sustainable pathway to facilitate localism, diversity, and competition. I want to acknowledge the fine work on this item by the Media Bureau, the Office of General Counsel, Maria Kirby of the Chairman's Office, and Adonis Hoffman in my office. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Media ownership matters. It matters because it plays a powerful part in shaping who we are, as individuals, as communities, and as a nation. So today we begin our most recent quadrennial review of our media ownership rules at a time when every one of us here can acknowledge the landscape is changing. The ways we create, distribute, and consume content are different. Information is now more plentiful than ever before, and anyone with internet access has access to his or her own printing press. And this is exciting. Still, despite all this change, there is something unique about local broadcasting. Local broadcasting remains the dominant force in local news. It has special status under the law, and we have special duties under the law to ensure that the use of our airwaves is consistent with the values of localism, competition, and diversity. As we begin this round of our review of media ownership policies, there has been an unusual amount of attention paid to female and minority ownership of commercial broadcasting. Although our efforts to restrict joint sales agreements have jump-started this conversation, there seems to be broad agreement among my colleagues, members of Congress, and many broadcasters that women and minority ownership of broadcast assets matters. This consensus is a good thing. After all, the number of women and minority owners and operators of full power commercial broadcast stations can only be described as unacceptably low. So we need policies that can help bring us beyond the status quo. I hope the steps we take today will make a difference. I hope they are effective, but I'm open. Open to new ideas on how to boost women and minority ownership. Open to data that moves beyond intuition and anecdotal accounts. Open to the best ideas put forward by all stakeholders, 
from civil rights groups to minority business advocates to broadcasters and to members of Congress. I want to thank my colleagues for their vigorous interest in these issues and thank the Media Bureau for their hard work on this issue that matters so much to so many of us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Pye. I approve. I kid, I kid. I'm saying. <laughs> Mr. Riley. <laughs> As the chairman pointed out when we were testifying before Congress last week, we agree 90% of the time. This is one of the 10%. Uh, during the t my time as a commissioner, I have had the privilege of casting votes on hundreds of items. This almost certainly is the most problematic item I've encountered. <coughs> Let's start with the Commission's failure to complete our current quadrennial review. Our prior media ownership review ended on December 18, 2007. It has therefore been over six years since we have completed a task that we are required by law to complete every four years. This morning, the Commission could have and should have begun to live up to our legal responsibilities. I presented my colleagues with a plan that would have brought our current quadrennial review to a close today. I thank Commissioner O'Reilly for supporting my proposal. Unfortunately, the Commission took another path. Rather than completing the 2010 iteration of the quadrennial review process, we are folding it into yet another quadrennial review that is being launched today. When will we finish these old and new reviews? All we've been told is that the Media Bureau will present recommendations to the commissioners by June 30th, 2016. That's more than eight and a half years after we finished our last quadrennial review. At this point, the phrase is quite inapt. It's neither quadrennial nor a re review. Our decision today, or to be more accurate, our lack of decision, is a thumb in the eye of Congress and an evasion of our legal obligations. But my problem to, with today's item isn't just about process, for this isn't only a matter of fulfilling legal responsibilities or a concern about good government. Our dereliction of duty has a substantive impact in the real world. Our regulations should keep pace with what everyone acknowledges is a fast-changing media marketplace. But they have not. They are not. And after today, they will not. Consider the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule. That rule was adopted back in 1975, a time when the information marketplace was nothing like it is now. Back then, cable news didn't exist, neither did the internet. Now, Americans can access an ever-widening range of information and news online at any time, day or night, whenever they choose, so fewer and fewer of us subscribe to a daily newspaper. Now, had the prohibition on newspaper broadcast cross-ownership been eliminated years ago, the industry's prospects might look brighter than they do today. Investments in news gathering are more likely to be profitable when a company can distribute news over multiple platforms. And cross-owned television stations, on average, provide their viewers with more news than do other stations. Given these facts, and they are facts, and the substantial challenges facing the newspaper business, it doesn't make sense, to me at least, to single out broadcasters and prevent them from operating newspapers. Nonetheless, the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule is on track to celebrate its 40th birthday next year. And it's quite remarkable when you think about it. For, as one former FCC chairman put it, under current conditions in the media business, the FCC's rule is perverse. If a profitable broadcaster wants to buy a newspaper in this city, the FCC should welcome this extra support for the trouble-plagued newspaper industry. And who was that former FCC chairman? None other than my friend, Reed Hunt. Indeed, former FCC chairman of both parties, Hunt, Powell, Martin, and Janikowski, all have recognized the folly of the rule in its current form. And the Commission, in its two most recently completed quadrennial reviews, has found that it is not in the public interest to maintain the rule as is. Yet the rule remains on the books anyway. It has been said that after a nuclear holocaust, all that will be left are cockroaches and share. I submit that perhaps the time has come to add a third thing to that list, 
the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule. It doesn't have to be this way, and it certainly shouldn't. The Commission has not been able to conclude since 2000 that the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule remains in the public interest. And today, the Commission dodges the issue entirely, putting off the issue until 2016, 16 years after our last determination. So what's the solution at this point? While writs of mandamus are not to be issued lightly, I believe that the DC Circuit would now be justified in ordering the Commission to remove the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule from our books. Today's lack of action, in my judgment, is an unlawful effort to evade court review. The administrative process has gone off the rails, and the time has come for judicial intervention. Now, today, the Commission is unable to reach a decision as to whether the local television ownership rule, the local radio ownership rule, the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule, the radio television cross-ownership rule, or the dual network rule remain in the public interest. We do, however, cherry-pick one issue for resolution. Somehow, notwithstanding our ability to, or inability, rather, to reach a decision on any other topic, we decide that joint sales agreements, or JSAs, should be attributable for purposes of our local television ownership rule. What is a JSA? It is an agreement between broadcast stations that allows them to cut down on costs by using the same advertising sales force. That's it. By entering into JSAs and shared service agreements, or SSAs, local broadcasters are better able to secure bank financing, attract advertising revenue, produce original programming, including news, and modernize their facilities. Now, while local broadcasters across the nation benefit from JSAs, the effects are especially pronounced outside of our lar nation's largest markets. The need to achieve efficiencies in these markets is greater because advertising re revenue there is much more challenging to come by. In smaller markets, the choice is not between two stations entering into a JSAs, and those two stations flourishing while operating completely independently. Rather, the choice is between two stations entering into JSAs and at least one of those stations' viability being threatened. If stations in these smaller markets are to survive and provide many of the services as television stations in larger markets, they must cut costs. There's no other way around it. And JSAs are a vital mechanism for doing just that. Additionally, the record is replete with evidence that JSAs promote localism and diversity. Here are just some of the uncontested facts. More can be found in my written statement. In Springfield, Missouri, a JSA between KYTV and KSPR demonstrates just how dramatically JSAs can pr improve the quality of local programming. Before it entered into a JSA, KSPR provided limited news programming, had outdated facilities, and simply lacked the resources to cover news outside of the immediate Springfield area. Since entering into a JSA, however, KSPR was able to produce the first HD local news broadcast in the Springfield market and conduct its own independent investigative reporting. In fact, KSPR was recently awarded the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Award for the best newscast by a station in a market outside of the top 50. Moreover, KSPR's closed captioning technique for its weather and sports newscasts recently served as the basis just last month of the Commission's own best practices template. In other words, JSAs not only allow local broadcasters to stay afloat, they enable lo local broadcasters to better serve their communities. On the other coast, before a JSA in the Eureka, California market, uh, neither the ABC-affiliated station nor the Fox-affiliated station were able to carry any local news. But as a result of the economies of scale created by a JSA, both stations are now planning on launching separate, non-repeat local newscasts in July 2014, tripling the number of competitors providing local news in the Eureka market. And in the Tri-Cities, Tennessee, Virginia market, the JSA has allowed one station to go from airing no local news at all to airing 38 hours per week. In my home state of Kansas, as I've said several times, the JSA has allowed KWCH in Wichita to provide valuable Spanish language programming. 
because of this JSA, KWCH is now able to broadcast weekday, hour-long newscasts in HD, as well as weather and emergency crawls, all in Spanish. With Wichita being located in Tornado Alley, these services are crucial for the safety of the area's growing Latino population. However, a representative of KWCH told me earlier this year that all of the Spanish language news will go off the air if the company is forced to terminate its JSA. Across the border in the Show Me State, a JSA between KSNF and KODE in Joplin, two stations I grew up with, produced $3.5 million in cost savings. Now, some of that money was used to upgrade the station's Doppler radar system, which likely saved lives when a devastating tornado destroyed much of Joplin in 2011. Now, JSAs also play a critical role in facilitating minority ownership. For example, WLOO is owned by Tugaloo College, a historically African-American college in Jackson, Mississippi. And since entering a JSA with Jackson's WDBD, WLOO has been able to thrive despite the college's limited resources. Among other things, WLOO has upgraded to HD, and WLOO now produces its own content and carries programming created by and for African Americans, providing a platform for diverse voices in the media marketplace. WLOO also covers local high school sports, furthering the commission's interest in localism. Now, without its JSA, none of this would have been possible for WLOO. Indeed, the station's general manager, Purvis Parker, personally told me that he doubts the station would have survived but for the JSA. Now, additionally, JSAs have allowed Armstrong Williams to become one of the only African-American full-power broadcasters in the United States today. And, but for the Media Bureau's recent public notice regarding JSAs, he soon would be adding two more stations to his portfolio. Instead, with respect to the issue of diversity, consider this. There is only one African-American full-power commercial television station in the entire United States today that is not a party to a JSA. So you might ask, what is the Commission's response to all of this evidence contained in the record? The item essentially ignores it. To be sure, the order grudgingly admits that JSAs may have some public interest benefits in some circumstances. But we are told that these benefits are irrelevant to today's decision, that they should be considered in the context of the local television ownership rule. However, the Commission refuses to make any decision today about whether our local television ownership rule needs to be modified. Instead, we have been informed that that decision, perhaps, will come sometime after June of 2016. This is a classic bait and switch. The Commission will consider broadcasters' arguments about JSA's public interest benefits, not now, but in a proceeding that won't even be resolved until after the Commission's two-year deadline for terminating JSAs. This is the epitome of arbitrary and capricious decision-making. I hope that our nation's courts will not countenance this cynical maneuver to wipe JSAs off the books without taking into consideration the resulting public interest harms. So the record contains overwhelming evidence regarding the public interest benefits produced by JSAs. But all of these public interest benefits must be weighed against any harm caused by JSAs. And on this issue, the case presented in the item is embarrassingly weak. Let's start with the basics. JSAs, of course, are principally about the sale of advertising time. It is curious, then, that the item does not cite a single advertiser who has filed a single complaint about a single JSA. This is the dog that didn't bark. Instead, the Commission's decision today relies almost entirely on its theory that a JSA uh, allows one station to exert undue influence over another station's programming decisions and operations. Where is the evidence to support this theory? Well, here too, the item does not contain a single example of a station in a JSA exercising undue influence over another station. Indeed, the item does not contain a single instance where a JSA has allowed one station to influence a single programming decision of another station. Here's a second dog that didn't bark. Moreover, this evidence-free theory contradicts long-held precedents based on economic realities. When a broadcast station ret uh, retains a substantial portion of its advertising revenues, 
It has a significant economic incentive to control its programming and operations. If the station's advertising revenues go up, the brokered station will get the substantial majority of the upside. And if the station's advertising revenues go down, the brokered station will get hit with the substantial majority of the downside. That might explain why, since 2008, the Commission has approved 85 JSAs in the course of transactional reviews. For the Media Bureau has repeatedly approved JSAs only where the brokered station receives at least 70% of the advertising revenue generated by that station, reasoning that such a division of revenues does not give the brokering station de facto control of or undue influence over the brokered station. This precedent is sound, and we should have adhered to it today. Now, a decision to attribute JSAs on a prospective basis would be bad enough, but unfortunately, it gets worse. Today, the Commission refuses to grandfather existing JSAs. Instead, JSAs in most markets must be unwound within two years. This is not how we usually do things. When the Commission adopted its newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule, it grandfathered existing combinations because of the disruption and losses which could be expected to attend divestiture. The same is true here. In fact, grandfathering <laughs> reflects the basic principle that the Commission should not bless an agreement only to change its rules and later force parties to unwind that agreement. Now, as I mentioned earlier, since 2008, the Commission has approved transactions involving 85 JSAs. But what is our message today to companies that have entered into such arrangements? We borrow from the expression often used by Emily Latella, the Saturday Night Live character brought to life by Gilder Radner. Never mind. Furthermore, the ramifications of this decision extend far beyond the confines of this proceeding. By vitiating already approved transactions, the Commission creates uncertainty throughout the communications marketplace. Investors will be more reluctant to risk their capital when the regulator has no compunction about undoing the deals. And it's not as if private equity, venture capital, or other major financiers have been flocking to small town broadcasters as it is. I also fear what this decision means for the incentive auction. For broadcasters to participate in that auction, they must have confidence that we will follow through on our commitments. But after today's item, our promises regarding the incentive auction may prove as illusory as our prior approvals of JSAs. A deficit of trust is especially problematic for the many broadcasters that may consider channel sharing. On one hand, the Commission wants our nation's broadcasters to embrace channel sharing. On the other, we are cracking down on st stations sharing an advertising sales force, and we are signaling that the sharing of other services might soon be on the chopping block. And so, broadcasters who volunteer to share channels might be the heroes of today. But will they become the villains of tomorrow? Who's to say? To mitigate the damage, the Commission points out that broadcasters are free to seek waivers. This is cold comfort. The waiver standard set forth in the item is not objective or measurable, but rather vague and inchoate. The Commission will take into account the totality of the circumstances in order to assess whether strict compliance with the rule is inconsistent with the public interest. Now, to be sure, the Commission lists some uh, re relevant considerations, but they are soft as mush. It is impossible to tell which considerations, if any, will be outcome determinative. This waiver standard will not provide broadcasters with any certainty, and I have no confidence that it will be used to avoid most of the negative impacts of today's decision. Instead, it is a fig leaf. Today's item gives the Media Bureau almost unbridled discretion to grant or deny a waiver request. And while I very much hope that I am wrong, I fear that the substantial majority of requests will not meet with a favorable response. Finally, a brief word about the Commission's treatment of the Third Circuit's remand of our 2008 diversity order. I'm disappointed that this item spends 41 pages discussing the topic, but doesn't take a single action to promote ownership diversity or new entry into the broadcasting industry. Our nation's president campaigned for office, speaking about the fierce urgency of now. This item, by contrast, ex exhibits the casual indifference of whenever. Now, since taking office, I've heard repeatedly that the greatest barrier to minority ownership in the broadcast industry is a lack of access to capital. And that's why I believe, 
and have believed for a couple of years now that the Commission should have established a voluntary incubator program as proposed by the diversity and competition supporters. Commissioner O'Reilly and I supported including an incubator program in today's item, but unfortunately, we fell one vote short. An incubator program has received widespread support from civil rights organizations, and it is unfortunate that we couldn't join together to establish such a program. At the end of the day, today's item is little more than an elaborate shell game expressly designed to evade judicial review. We maintain the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership rule without modification, but we refuse to find that doing so is necessary in the public interest. And we make JSAs attributable for purposes of our local television ownership rule, but we refuse to address the substantial record evidence that taking this step will harm localism and diversity. For all of the foregoing reasons, I hope that our nation's judiciary will at long last restore sanity to our media ownership proceeding. I respectfully dissent. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think I picked the wrong time to drink my soda before I came in. <laughs> <laughs> Today's action goes against the letter and the spirit of the law, imposes misguided restrictions on television broadcasters without basic data, and ultimately harms the statutory goals of competition, diversity, and localism. I must therefore strenuously dissent. I will start where we all should, with the statute. Section 202H of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 directs the FCC to review these ownership limits every four years and to repeal or modify the ones that no longer can be justified due to competition. Unfortunately, the Commission has failed to fulfill this congressional mandate. Instead of completing the 2010 review that fell through the cracks under the last chairman, this item turns it into a further notice of proposed rulemaking. As a result, the Commission has not concluded a review of the media ownership rules since, since 2006 proceeding. Meanwhile, this item launches a FNR, a FNPRM, but we are told that recommendations from this exercise may not be presented to the Commission until June 30, 2016. This makes a highly likely that a nearly a decade will pass before we update our media ownership rules. Our job is to comply with the law, even when it means taking tough decisions. Failure to do so here is not only an enormous embarrassment, it is also damaging precedent for the agency, and I'm deeply troubled by it. While the record for the 2010 review has been deemed too outdated for any other issues to be acted upon, it plucks out the exception joint sales arrange agreements, or JSAs, which the order effectively bans. These arrangements appear to work quite well, enabling smaller stations to take advantage of the economies of scale and put their cost savings towards improved programming, thereby enhancing their ability to compete. Like my colleague, Commissioner Pai, who's raised this in the past, I've repeatedly asked for an accurate accounting of the number of JSAs, which markets they are in, and any particulars with their establishment. To date, I've been unable to attain such information from either internal or external sources. The FCC is supposed to be a data-driven agency. Will this harm viewers in small and mid-sized markets? We haven't done this analysis. I'm deeply troubled that we appear to be basing this decision on a philosophical dislike of certain business practices while willfully lacking the facts and not knowing what effects our actions will have on communities that rely on these stations. Even the chairman acknowledges the fact that there are good JSAs. And he says those stations will be allowed to seek a waiver from the rules on a case-by-case -case basis. Assuming for a moment that there are good JSAs and bad JSAs, which the item does not quali uh, qualify, this process is not a viable option. It puts all stations at the mercy of arbitrary and capricious decision-making. Any factor can come into play when determining if and when a waiver request is reviewed and how it is resolved, which means the process will be an inher inherently uncertain and subjective. We've been told one our overarching reason for today's action is to bring transparency and sunshine. And yet, these statements cannot be reconciled with the non-transparent and unpredictable waiver process. Investors will flee from smaller stations and they will become weaker, potentially go dark, or have to cut back on local programming. How can this possibly be in the public interest? Everyone in this debate readily acknowledges the rapidly changing and highly competitive nature of our media platforms, and yet our rules are stuck in the past. 
Perhaps the best example of this is the harm from our antiquated rules is newspapers. Here's a few data points to consider. For perfect timing. This slide highlights the total number of daily newspapers in U.S. decreasing from 1730 to 1382 between 1981 and 2011. This is a seesaw that is not going to swing back otherwise. Additionally, the advertising revenues of newspapers have decreased by more than 50 percent between 2003 and 2012, from 46 billion to 22 billion. The Boston Globe was sold in 2013 to Boston Red Sox owner John Henry for 70 million, significantly less than the 1.1 billion the New York Times paid for the Globe in 1993. And the Washington Post was sold in 2013 to Amazon.com founder Jeff Bezos for only 250 million. And that included the so-called friendship premium, or overpaying because he had an arrangement with the previous owners. Eliminating these bans could allow newspapers to raise needed capital and lower the debt ratio, giving them a fighting chance. Today's item forces a rhetorical question which has been asked before. Which happens first? The commission eliminates the newspaper broadcast bans or traditional daily newspaper publishing becomes extinct. In closing, I'm very opposed to today's item. It takes an unjustified step backwards in tightening our media ownership rules, and it fails in our duty to update these limits in a timely fashion to reflect the robust competition in the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. You know, the Commission has um, long imposed limits on concentration of ownership for the use of the public's airwaves, which it licenses, um, and has a statutory goal to promote competition diversity and localism. Today what we're doing is closing off what has been a growing end run around those rules. At the same time, we make it clear that JSAs are appropriate when they further those statutory goals of competition, diversity, and localism. We've heard a lot about the alleged impact on small broadcasters um, and entrepreneurs by the elimination of these rules, but it is the opposite which is the reality. JSAs have been used skirting the existing rules to create market power that stacks the deck against small companies seeking to enter the broadcast business. It's for that reason that organizations representing these groups have filed in support of this action. The Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the Minority and Media Telecoms Council, the NAACP, the National Association of Black Journalists, the National Association of Black-Owned Broadcasters, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, the National Hispanic Media Coalition, the National Organization for Women, the National Urban League, Rainbow Push, the Women's Institute for Freedom of the Press. The National Association of Black-Owned Broadcasters and the National Association of Black Journalists perhaps said it best, quote, agreements that transfer the vast majority of the value of a station to the larger company do little to further the goals of media diversity. In the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus said such sharing agreements impugn and harm diversity, localism, and competition. Oftentimes, bad practices hide behind the skirts of good actors. And we must be careful that we do not regulate by anecdote. So, amidst all of this, I'd like to ask of the Media Bureau, and specifically the Chief, Bill Lake, 
A few things for the record. Bill, we've heard discussions of how GSAs are being used today, including examples of their utility. What has the Bureau observed about the use of JSAs? First, it's important to remember what a JSA is and what it is not. It's a way for two stations to join forces in the sale of advertising. It is not a means by which two stations cut the general costs of their operation, like the purchase of a single traffic helicopter or Doppler radar capability. That's usually accomplished through a, an SSA, a shared services agreement. As to JSAs, we see that they are being used more and more. And increasingly in transactions that contain JSAs, we see that they lead to all of one station's advertising being controlled by another station. That control of advertising is effective control of programming. In its recent filing, the Department of Justice noted the same trend. By acting now, the Commission restores the integrity of its rules. The longer we wait, the more deals we will have to be unwinding. Thank you. So at the same time, there may be circumstances in which JSAs serve the public interest, as Commissioner O'Reilly indicated I had said previously, even if they meet the new attribution requirement. That's why today's order explains how the Commission will apply its waiver rules in these circumstances. Can you take us through what that analysis will be, since it will be happening in your Bureau? Yes. We thought it important that the waiver issue be explicitly discussed in the order. Paragraph 364 provides that in a particular case, a party may be able to show that even though a JSA exceeds the 15 percent threshold, it is structured in such a way that it does not confer influence over programming. That could justify a waiver of attribution. Alternatively, a party could show that even though the JSA does confer influence over programming, the overall arrangement creates such benefits to competition, localism, and diversity that it's justified to grant a waiver of the local TV ownership limit itself. So, Commissioner Clyburn has helped us all a great deal by focusing on the need to process these waiver requests promptly. Uh, and the item talks about 90 days after the close of the record. Can you tell us how you would administer that direction? Let me take you three, through three possible circumstances. We may see a JSA used that involves no change of effective ownership, where pre-existing stations engage in simple cost sharing. In other words, where the JSA is not equivalent to an acquisition of one in-market station by another. An example would be two stations sharing advertising sales in a manner that does not impair the independence of either. Where there are no facts to suggest effective influence, despite the application of attribution, we should be able to move quickly. The second type of JSA is one where there has been an effective acquisition of a second in-market station, but where there are also efficiencies that can be shown to be achievable through sharing. And very importantly, there is no acquisition-related financial entanglement between the sharing stations to com compromise or impair the independence of either station's operations. Obviously, the issue here is more complicated. In this situation, there is the kind of influence or control that the attribution rule is designed to prevent. Yet we would be asked to balance that against cognizable efficiencies designed to very specifically further the core values of localism, diversity, and competition. This will require a more thorough examination, but I believe it can be accomplished quickly. Our ability to move quickly, of course, depends on the state of the record. The more concrete the submission, the faster we can close the record and start the 90-day period. This brings us to the third type of JSA, those where effective control apparently has passed from one licensee to another through a myriad of arrangements that combine the ability of stations to gain revenue, to cut costs, and to access financial resources. 
we need to be very careful here. Of course, there may be circumstances in which a waiver would be available in these circumstances, but one would imagine that the required showing of necessity and positive impact on the public interest would have to be very high to overcome the various forms of entanglement. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Lake, uh, and, and particularly thank you for explaining the differences um, among um, various realities that have all been conflated together, uh, in, either in one term or by putting multiple practices together into a, a broad characterization. Um, and I know that as part of your management of this process, you will implement efficiently and we will be counting on you to implement efficiently uh, the Commission's order uh, in these circumstances. Um, so if there are no further comments, I'll move to a vote. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The ayes have it. The item is adopted. The request for editorial privileges is granted. Thank you very much to the Media Bureau for all of your hard work on, on this. Um, that being the last item on the agenda, we now approach the point in the meeting where uh, the uh, commissioners have an opportunity to make any announcements. Uh, anybody have anything to bring to the good of the organization? I actually do, sorry. Yes, sir. I just wanted to announce my pleasure that uh, Brendan Carr has uh, joined uh, my office as a legal advisor. He's going to be focusing on wireless, public safety, and uh, international issues. Uh, Brendan comes from a place that is close to my heart, the Office of General Counsel. Uh, prior to joining OGC, Brendan was an attorney at Wiley Ryan, where he worked on uh, telecom litigation, appellate, and regulatory matters. Uh, earlier in his career, Brendan clerked for Judge Dennis Shedd on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. He got his uh, bachelor's from Georgetown, his law degree, magna cum laude from Catholic, with a, a certificate from its Institute for Communications Law Studies. And uh, he also interned during law school here for then Commissioner uh, Abernathy and for the Enforcement Bureau. Uh, he also worked on Capitol Hill for the House Subcommittee on Communications, Technology, and the Internet. All that, and he has a full beard to boot. Uh, since joining our office, I've discovered, much to my chagrin, that Brendan's favorite movie of all time is Step Brothers, featuring Will Ferrell. And had I known that, I might have thought twice about extending the offer. <laughs> But he's here nonetheless. I also want to thank uh, Jeff Newman, uh, who uh, graciously agreed to serve in my office as an acting legal advisor for several months. Uh, Jeff is truly a real commodity. He's both an engineer and a lawyer. Uh, he uh, brought a wealth of experience and breadth of knowledge to our office, and it was a real asset to have him. Among other things, uh, Jeff led uh, my office's inquiry into the state of MLTS calling from hotels, and uh, I really appreciate all he did to bring this issue really to a national level. I'll certainly miss Jeff's wise counsel, and I'm uh, thankful that uh, the commission will continue to benefit from his public service. I'm also glad, frankly, to just call him a friend. Uh, last but not least, it doesn't involve our office, but I couldn't let it go without mention that the FCC has made one of its greatest hires in recent years, the Deputy General Counsel for Litigation in the Office of General Counsel, David Gossett. Uh, he's one of my oldest friends. We met almost 20 years ago this year when we were both law students, uh, early law students at the University of Chicago. Uh, David is a tremendous lawyer. He came to us from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and I am so grateful that he has been willing to apply his talents uh, to, to the agency. Certainly hope I don't generate too much work for him, though, in the future. Um, and in exchange, we're giving away Mike Byrne as uh, the term. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean, well, I don't want to steal your thunder. No, but go for it. Uh, no, but I did want to say that uh, you know, Mike uh, Byrne, our geographic officer, gave us a presentation early on in my tenure that really, I mean, literally opened my eyes wide when I saw it on the screen. I think he is probably the best example of that adage that a picture says a thousand words. And what he has been able to do by bringing to life some of the facts that previously uh, existed on cold, dry, dead paper um, is just remarkable. I mean, not just for us here in the commission, but for people around the country who want to get more insight into our work and the facts that we gather. So uh, thank you, Mike, to, uh, for your service. He's actually going back to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau from whence David came. So I guess we have some sort of exchange program going on. But uh, anyway, we look forward to working with Eric and the rest of the team on mapping issues going forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh so um, I uh, want to uh, thank the Office of Workplace Diversity and the great job that uh, you all did, along with Commissioner Pye and Commissioner Clyburn, 
uh, celebrating Women's History Month. Um, and uh, the, the job that was done to bring together uh, that kind uh, of a program uh, on an important topic was excellent. And, uh, and thank you to all of you. Um, I also want to pile on uh, with uh, what Commissioner Pai was saying about Mike Byrne, hiding back over there in the, in the back corner, um, mapping Mike, as I uh, <laughs> called him, um, and, and, and agree that how much he has brought us as our first um, geographic information officer, what you've done with the, what you did with the broadband plan map, uh, Mike, uh, what you did to bring us uh, uh, into an open source world so we could uh, use these new new tools um, was uh, was non uh, trivial um, and I agree that uh, with you commissioner that uh, Eric you will be a, a, a great uh, uh, person to step in uh, to uh, Mike's rather sizable shoes um, and uh, this was not an exchange. Uh, this was a trade. Um, uh, we 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 got David and a player to be named later, um, and the CFPB um, got uh, got Mike. But thank you, Mike, and the best of luck to you. And um, uh, how fortunate Richard Cadre is to be able to uh, to be able to call on uh, on your expertise. But thank you very much. Uh, if there's nothing else to bring before uh, the body, uh, then we will announce that the next meeting of the commission will be on Wednesday, April 23rd, 2014. We look forward to seeing you all then. This meeting is adjourned. Hello, y'all. Are you going to do it or just – I have some really – I have some words to share with you. Uh, really, this is a really important uh, day. Big, big deal. Um, the good news is it's opening day, and the snow was yesterday, not today. Uh, it's going to warm into the 60s. The even better news is that Michigan is not going to the final four <laughs> because of its crushing defeat, last, uh, last second defeat yesterday. Uh, but even better than those things, the commission took a number of significant actions today that will benefit consumers, preserve local broadcasting, and promote innovation and competition. More than a decade after it was first proposed, the commission voted to enforce rules that are on the books by closing a loophole some have used to circumvent these rules that have been intended to prevent media ownership consolidation while including a waiver to preserve agreements that serve the public interest. It's a win for competition, but more than that, folks, it's a win for common sense. We adopted an order that will help curtail practices that have put upward pressure on cable prices. That's a big win for consumers. And finally, we took big steps to free up spectrum, making available unlicensed spectrum for Wi-Fi that will ease network congestion in homes and public spaces and laying the groundwork for a significant spectrum auction later this fall. Those are also wins for consumers and for the economy. And so collectively, all of these actions advance the public interest and I really do. You know, you know, we spend a lot of time up here saying, I want to thank the Bureau, I want to thank the Bureau, and this sort of stuff, which is entirely, entirely appropriate because um, the Commission staff really does hard, challenging, and excellent work. And um, I hope you guys, you folks, will um, give credit where credit is due in, in that instance with the great work that, uh, that the team around here does on not inconsequential 
and not easy issues. So with that, why don't we sh – oh, Paul is assuming I'm going to start on that side? What if that, I throw it to Brooks correct. just to throw Brooks off? Well, um, no, it's better if you start here. Okay, Paul. We'll, like, bookend it. See, you just want a bad cleanup. I know, you know. Yes, sir, Paul. Um, so in the 5 gigahertz, another issue is the 8, is the 4-band, uh, and that's 5850 to 5925. Right. Now, you had told the House in, in November you won't do anything that would cause interference to the DSRC you folks. Remembered. Um, is there a sense for when, now there, there's a Tiger team and the IEEE is looking at there, is there a sense for when you would like to act on that, realizing you all are waiting for some of that work to be done? Yeah, we are, I mean, it, it's, it's, there's a gating factor there uh, as a result of that. Um, I think that obviously I'm a sooner rather than later um, kind of a guy, but I can't give you a date on it. Paul. Okay. I introduce myself. My name is Jeff Bliss, and I'm a reporter for MLEX. Hey, Jeff. And Welcome. Thank you. Um, a question. Um, last week, DOJ officials said that they would use the model of working with you guys in terms of the, t um, the um, NBCU Comcast merger and previously AT&T T-Mobile merger in terms of coordination. They said there's been a lot of coordination already on Comcast, Time Warner Cable. And I'm just wondering if you're going to extend that those similarities to hiring an independent person from outside like you did in those two previous cases. So um, what we're doing right now, yes, we are, we are uh, frequently in touch with the Justice Department. Uh, and we have put together uh, a task force on uh, Comcast uh, Time Warner. Um, we will bring in the necessary external help. We have not gone outside to hire someone to run that task force, but rather have someone who is – well experienced in the aforementioned issues that you you talked about, um, and as other things That's develop internally, I just want to make internal, sure. yeah, got it. Okay, and and, and as far as far as uh, other things which I keep reading about in the newspaper, we'll see how we have to structure ourselves for that. Thank you, Elena. Hi, sorry, I'm putting in here. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the comments uh, made last week by Sprint Chairman uh, Masashi San and the um, agreements that they're striking with rural carriers. Rural carriers are saying it's a really nice um, addition to the interoperability order that came out last year that didn't doesn't seem to be quite kicking in yet full force. I just wanted to see if you wanted to comment on the soft soft bank sprint agreement with rural carriers and the how it fits with the interoperability work that you guys are doing we're all for interoperability and expansion of coverage <laughs> okay uh, kate tamarella with the hill kate. um i was wondering if you have any comment on the bill moving to be considered by the house commerce committee to re, um, reauthorize stella mm -hmm. there's language in it that's being worked out the Democrats that would prevent the FCC from taking the kind of action it took today on media ownership. I'm wondering what your comment is. Uh, I know it's a matter of debate inside the committee, um, and um, you know we uh, we have followed the law with our action, um, and uh, look forward to seeing what the committee does. Jim Pusengaro with the LA Times. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you about newspaper um, TV cross ownership. Um, if the media landscape has changed so dramatically, um, why does this rule continue to survive? Uh, I think the question uh, is there's, there's multiple parts to that, Jim. Uh, the, what we need to be doing and what we are doing and what we propose today is to take a look um, in a more robust way than perhaps we have in the past at some of these issues, this included. Um, one of the things that we need to look at, for instance, is something illustrated by your company and, you know, which once was a broadcaster um, and what that says. And we'll get that information and make a decision. Uh, Bryce Bashir with Bloomberg BNA. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Um, wanted to ask you, uh, as the Commission um, uh, starts its net neutrality rulemaking, um, what what kind of behaviors are you seeking to curb, uh, and can you provide examples of those? Well, I think we're back to what what are the what are the basic concepts? We want to have transparency, so that consumers know just what's going on, and so that um, those who use the network know just what the practices are, and that's something that the court 
upheld. We want to make sure that there is no blocking um, of lawful uh, content, and we want to make sure that there is non-discrimination. Um, those are the principles. We're going to move forward on those principles um, based on the um, outline that the court gave us as to what they feel is an appropriate way to do that. Right, but what about the, the practices in the marketplace right now? Are there certain practices that are existing in the marketplace that you definitely want to curb? No, but I think what I have said repeatedly in answer to questions like that is that when we get to non-discrimination and other kinds of questions, we will look at them on a case-by-case -case basis against a section, uh, a, a set of, of standards. And I'm not going to sit up here and, before a rulemaking, make judgments about activities. But I'm going to tell you that an open Internet is crucially of, of crucial importance to maintain, and we intend to do that. Thank you. Gotham. Hi, Gautam Nagesh with the Wall Street Journal. Um, you previously indicated that you didn't think the commission should have m uh, much more of a role regulating peering or interconnection between uh, big content providers and ISPs. Um, is that how you feel now? We've seen Netflix and some other people call for peering to be included in the net neutrality debate. I'm not sure where you're quoting that I said that. Um, the um, one of the things that I have said repeatedly is that part of the network compact is interconnection, and peering is a three dollar three dollar and fifty cent word uh, in an internet society for interconnection. Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Uh, the commission vote today on the JSA and ownership item kind of split along party lines. Is it a defeat for you that the commission didn't? Go unanimous is unanimity, unanimity important for the commission. <clears throat> well, I think it's important to emphasize that we had uh, every other vote here was 5-0. Mm -hmm. uh, as Commissioner Pai indicated, he and I vote together 90% uh, of the time. Um, uh, un unanimity. I can't say it either. Unanimity uh, is is a good goal, but should not be a controlling force. Yes, uh, Tom Risen, U.S. News and World Report. Um, with the merger being reviewed uh, between Comcast and Time Warner Cable, is it possible that one of the conditions, uh, possible conditions set on the merger could be the future of peering agreements or other net neutrality regulations that uh, the new company would have to abide by? Wow, Tom, you're way down the road on this. A lot of people are. This hasn't been filed yet. Okay. A lot of people are looking ahead to how the conditions could look. I, the, we have nothing on the record right now to make a decision like that. Brendan. Hi, Chairman. Um, I just want to follow up on Gotham's question. Uh, and so you had mentioned that peering was something you do want to look at. Uh, is that something you want to look at in the net neutrality proceeding? I think one of the things that I have said along the way is um, is that that – Peering is not uh, a net neutrality issue. We haven't seen peer peering as a net neutrality issue, um, and um, uh, and uh, there is a there is a matter of the open internet. Then there is a matter of interconnection uh, among the various disparate pathways that become the internet. Brooks. Brooks Malik, Politico. Um, the decision you took today on JSAs and, uh, you know, and the uh, further <coughs> notice on SSAs and uh, network non-duplication and syndicated exclusivity, you made a move on the broadcast ownership rule. Are you just putting the screws to broadcasters to get them to play ball in the incentive auction? <laughs> um, I always love the way you're so subtle in your questions. Baloney. That's my non-subtle response. I'll take it. Hi, Commissioner Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. Can you give a little color, please, or detail on the uh, task force you mentioned? You formed a task force for Comcast, Time Warner Cable. Who, who's on it? Lots of people, every bureau. Is it a joint thing with DOJ? How, how, a little yeah, bit we'll, on how it we'll, works. we'll be announcing uh, the structure of it, but um, obviously um, – even though something hasn't been filed, we've begun to think how we want to organize. That's only uh, prudent management. Um, and uh, when, in fact, we are presented with something, which I reiterate, we have not been presented with anything, 
when we are in fact uh, presented with something, if we are in fact presented with something, then we will announce how we're going to handle it. And, and do you expect an outside hire to head it? What I said in, to the, in response to the previous question was uh, what our planning is right now is we're going to do it with a, an inside person who right. has uh, experience uh, in previous similar activities. Thank you. Great. Ruth, get a new job. Get job. You know, Ruth had Ruth held every job in this yeah, agency, does. right? But I'm she's too valuable. I would never part with Ruth. Thanks, everybody. It looks like there's questions for the bureaus. Um, any questions for wireless? Okay. Yes, there are. Come on up. Um, that's OET. That's, that's, that's not wireless. wireless. Well, yes. Ju Julie. <laughs> hey. This is on Julie. the unlicensed item? Yeah. Uh, no, so, it's on the AWS 3. No, this is Julie is the 5 gigahertz. Yeah. And so, we'll, Julie. We'll bring the rest of you. Yes, sir. So, um, the... You know, at, at meetings and in press releases, they're kind of broad. So it's correct, isn't it, that the, the item essentially adopts the NCTA antenna standard plan? Because it, it that's talks a, about just pieces of it. So yeah, I, I think know. that's a fair description. Okay. And then um, it didn't say it in the press release, but I wanted to make sure. Is it correct that Uni 3 would be extended from 5825 to 585? Yeah, that's right. That's It's the combination of the okay. two. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure. All right, that was all I had for that. Thank you. And do you expect to get it out today, or try? You, is that your anticipation? That's our goal. Okay. Yeah. This is AWS three. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any any more on the unlicensed item, the uni item? Then we probably need the wireless bureau. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. The bureau. I'm just part of the one. <laughs> I'm the deputy part of the wireless bureau, so. What's the uh, question? So has the commission uh, conducted any estimates about how much it will cost uh, to transition federal users away from uh, some of the bands? So uh, the uh, spectrum law of the past 2012 and previous laws have a requirement that the um, agencies submit uh, what they call transition plans to Congress. Those transition plans are reviewed by a technical panel, which is made up of members of the FCC, OMB, and NTIA. Um, and the technical panels give feedback on those plans, which include uh, cost estimates uh, back to the agencies, and they're uh, still working through that now. Um, the output of that process will be uh, the major uh, determination. It will be the answer to the question you asked. A any timeline for that? Um, they're to be published in May. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, coming months, they'll be published. We're, the, the main goal we have is to publish all the information we need to well in advance the auction so bidders can make informed bids. Thank you. Sure. I'm waiting for the Media Bureau. John, okay. John so um, is it correct that the, the item, it requires interoperability from AWS 3 to 1, but it, it doesn't require it including 4, right? It just says some language in, uh, encouraging voluntarily. Uh, yeah, you'll read it for yourself and see what it says, but it, yeah, that's that's correct. There's not a uh, requirement for AWS 4, um, but there is uh, some language speaking to um, uh, that the commission could take further action after the auction uh, if uh, interoperability does not occur and there is not a, um, a technical reason for that. Okay. And then just to double check the, because you changed, obviously you changed the, the number of smaller blocks um, from the original item. The um, For the 1755 to 80 to 2155 to 80, you have a 5x5 five five, uh, CMA, and then you have two 5x5s five e EA and a uh, one 10x10 10 10 EA. Can you just tell us which blocks those are? In that order from the bottom up. So okay, CMA the at the bottom, bottom two 5x5s, okay. five then one 10x10. 10 10. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Anything else for wireless bureau? Okay. Um, questions for the Media Bureau? Monty has one. Okay. Who is Bill? I mean to make you all stay. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so uh, just 
One of my questions was, we know that um, JSAs can get the waiver. Is there any provision in the waiver rules for if the for when the waiver runs out? Does it have a time limit on it? Does it leave with a transaction or? Uh, there's nothing in the rules. It would be justified by the particular facts of a situation. And it might be a permanent waiver or it might be limited in years, depending on what the case is in favor of the waiver. So that's part of the Media Bureau's discretion then? Well, it's part of the case that would be made for the waiver, and then we would rule on that. Okay. And then we heard a lot of uh, – Commissioner Pai made a lot of statements talking about, you know, how – you know, calling for court action on a lot of these things. And I was wondering, is there any – provisions in here that make this, you know, that that are designed to survive a court challenge or that make this, you know, specially designed to live through something like that? We always try to write our orders in a way that com- comports with the law and uh, is not arbitrary and capricious, so it will be sustained by a court. That's, that's what the agency always does. And then this is my last one. Uh, I've written a lot of stories, you know, where I've had broadcaster types talking about ways they might try to get around it after this rule passes. Um, is there any is there anything in the text of the order that contemplates that kind of thing? Um, you know, I've, I've heard about going to SSAs. I realize this this rule wouldn't touch that, but things like channel sharing and other other workarounds. Is there anything anticipating that in this rulemaking? The order on JSAs is limited to attributing JSAs. Um, channel sharing, as you know, is something that the Commission is encouraging in, in the context of the incentive auction. Um, if, if there are changed arrangements, we've already had indications by some of the parties that have pending deals that they want to uh, change those deals in order to accommodate the JSA order. Uh, and we'll look at any structured deals on the basis of the facts as they come in. Todd. Bill Todd Shields with, uh, with Bloomberg News. Uh, a station applies under your waiver process and, and fails to obtain a waiver. What, uh, two stations uh, in, in the JSA today, they apply and fail to obtain a waiver. What is their recourse? What next steps for them? What they would need to do will depend on the facts of the situation. You could theoretically have a situation in which there's a JSA, um, but under our ownership rules, the entity would be allowed to own the station, so they could choose to buy the station. If they're not in that situation, if they already own a station in the market and they're not allowed under our rules to own another, there are various things they could do. They could reduce the JSA to below 15 percent. They could uh, abolish the JSA and restructure the transaction. Uh, They should eliminate – they could eliminate the relationship altogether. It would be a matter for the uh, judgment of of the station owners to decide how to restructure their situation. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Uh, Bryce Bashwick with Bloomberg BNA. Uh, the Republican commissioners uh, noted their concern with uh, the, the, the idea that grandfathering of JSAs would not be permitted. Um, wondering why the, the Bureau uh, decided not to grandfather JSAs uh, as it has with previous proceedings like the UH, UHF proceeding. Actually, in this case, we did exactly what we did with respect to radio. About 10 years ago when we attributed JSAs in the radio context, we allowed two years for existing JSAs to be unwound in one way or another, and we followed that precedent here. Thank you. Is that it? All right. Uh, Monty. Just to make sure, I, I think I understand this, but just to be clear, uh, the the two years to unwind, that starts from when the rule is published in the Federal Register, right? It's not two years after the existence of a JSA or anything. No, like it's that. two years from the effective date of, these, of this okay. order. Gotcha. Just making sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.